Patton, would you be able to explain just the procedures about how to see the raised hand icon or unmuting your mic option for um, seeking to make public comment on anything? Sure thing, uh, I can do that. Would you like me to do it before you officially call the meeting to order? Yeah, I think that would be more or pretty efficient. And then okay. to remind people to mute themselves, except when they're speaking, just so as not to pick up background noise. Will do, and I'll make sure that I'm muting people as well. Okay. Um, so I'll do that right at six and then just pass it right over to you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Rob, I like the new graphic. Clever. All right, welcome our guests and our trustees that are here. We've just got about three minutes before we get started. So just to let everyone know who's just joining, we are recording this meeting and that recording has already started. And we'll start at, right at six o'clock. Thank you. Alrighty, good evening to the guests that have just joined. Just to let you know, we are recording this meeting. That recording has already started. It will also be broadcast on MCAT starting at six o'clock. And in about one more minute, we'll get started with some overall instructions about the Zoom platform. Alrighty, good evening and welcome. This is Hatton Littman, the MCPS Communications Director speaking. Uh, welcome to our MCPS Board of Trustees meeting. If this is the first time you've joined on Zoom, whether it's on your computer or on phone, we just have a few basic um, instructions for how to use the platform. If you look towards the bottom of your screen, you can see a couple of icons. The first one that you want to look for is the one that says participants. If you click on that icon, it'll open a list of participants that are on the meeting and at the bottom, it gives you the option to raise your hand. So at times when you need to make public comment or trustees want it to be recognized, you can raise your hand there. 
The next icon right in the center of the screen is the chat icon. If you click on that icon, it opens up a window where you can type in uh, questions for chat. Uh, if you type in comments in that area, either we will ask you to unmute so that you can make them as public comment or the board chair will read them as public comment so that they can be acknowledged as such. So we avoid um, back and forth conversations amongst participants because that chat function is really for the public record. Uh, we are keeping all of our participants muted unless you are speaking and um, please do keep yourself muted and consider having your video off if you're not interested in having your picture shared during the meeting. For those that are joining on the phone, I'll repeat this later when it comes time for public comment, but if you need to unmute yourself on the phone, you press star six. And if you need to raise your hand, you press star nine. And for those that are watching us on MCAT, if you're watching on MCAT and you're wondering how can I make public comment, you would need to join the meeting via your computer or via your phone. And you can find the instructions for doing that right on the MCPS homepage. You just scroll down to the little calendar icon and click on today's meeting and it'll have details for how to join the meeting. And with that, I will turn it over to Chair Holland. Thank you. Um, and just for explanation, in order to make sure that everyone can hear me, I keep um, my image off the screen so I can have the computer as close as possible to me while I'm speaking, so apologies for that. So I will call the meeting to order. I will welcome everyone who is present um, virtually, and I will take roll call of the trustees. Um, so Board Chair Marsha Holland is here. Trustee Abgaris? I'm here. Thanks. Trustee Decker? Here, yes. Um, Vice Chair Lorenzen? Here. I know um, Trustee McDonald could not make this meeting. Um, Cohen Mercer? Here. Walina, or Trustee Oldperson? And Trustee Smith had also indicated he could not make this meeting. Trustee Sturbus? I'm here. Um, Trustee Vogel? I'm here. Thanks. And Trustee um, Wake? I'm here. Okay, great. And so on the agenda, um, item number two is that everyone please stand. And um, Superintendent Watson, if you don't mind us leading in the pledge, leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance, we will begin our meeting with the pledge. And can you see if Trustee or Superintendent Watson is unmuted? Sorry about that. Oh, Are we ready? Yeah, ready. <laughs> uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Now we come to item agenda item number three, which is to review, revise, and approve the agenda. I believe there is one request to revise the agenda. Uh, Dr. Watson, I believe you wanted to um, make some re one revision, or it's actually two, but related. Yeah, so the last item on the agenda this evening was an executive session, and we would uh, ask uh, from the administration side that we remove that item from the agenda. Uh, the circumstances have changed um, in that particular situation, so we're asking for that item to be removed from the board agenda. And I believe that would mean item number 12 would also be removed because the, um, we would have had to come out of executive session to take any action. So it would be items 11 and 12 will be deleted from the agenda? Correct. Okay. So I'm assuming no objections, so we'll go ahead and move on to Agenda item number four, which is to approve the minutes from the Board of Trustees regular meeting from June 23rd, 2020. Does anyone have any modifications that they'd want to make to the minutes? And I'm looking for hands being raised. Not seeing any, then is there a motion to approve the minutes from the June 23rd regular meeting? And let me get down in chat. Trustee Lorenzen has um, made the motion. Is there a second? 
seconded by Trustee Abgaris. All those in favor, please indicate by typing in yes into the chat room. Vogel is yes. Thank you. And I'm just checking, make sure I've had responses from everyone. And I see that trustee old person has also joined us as well. So she is now in attendance. So the motion passes and the minutes have been approved from the January or June 23rd board meeting. So now we move on to public comment on non-agenda items. These would be items that we won't be talking about at some point in the meeting. They're not listed on the agenda, but they're, they are um, comments that you'd like to make on items that you'd like the board to consider either um, in a administrative level or at a board level. And so the three things we ask is either raise your hand virtually or unmute your mic if you want to make public comment on non-agenda items. And we, try, we ask you to try to keep the um, comments to three minutes. And if you can identify yourself and if you have an unusual spelling of your name, spell it. And if you represent an organization or a group, please identify that group. And so with that being said, uh, is there any request for public comment on a non-agenda item? And I'll try to look for raised hands and I believe Hatton's going to help me look at Mike's being unmuted and then I'll check. At this point, I don't see anybody unmuted and I don't see any raised hands. I didn't either. So we'll go ahead and continue on. There is written correspondence in the packet beginning on page nine. Now we move on to 6A, which is the Health Insurance Trust Fund Report. This is a report that we see. It's a routine Health Insurance Trust Fund Report for the month of June 2020, beginning on page 18. This is for information. And then we move on to 6B which is announcements from the superintendent, Dr. Watson. Um, there's also a list, a written list of upcoming dates on page 19, but did you have any other announcements you'd like to make? Uh, I, I don't have any announcements. I do want to uh, just explain the upcoming dates for the board meetings, because they are slightly different than what we're used to. So typically we meet the second and the fourth Tuesday of the month. Uh, which that means we'll have a, a meeting on July 28th. I know we discussed earlier about potentially canceling that if we didn't need it, but um, we believe we are going to need that meeting. So July 28th. And then when we get into August, um, because of the budget cycle and the requirements of, of uh, uh, the Office of Public Instruction and the state law around when, when we adopt the budget, we actually had to move the meeting up. So normally our meeting would have been August 25th. Uh, but we're asking the board to come together on August 20th in order to meet those uh, budget requirements. So that's a special budget meeting that I'm sure Pat will allude to later on in his report. So that's all I have. Okay, thanks. Now we move on to 7A1, which is the, I believe the last of our Smart Schools 2020 update. So I see, I think Pat and Bur Burley are both on and I didn't know who wants to introduce it looks like, I don't know if Eric's there, but Aaron and Tyson perhaps uh, from Holting will be talking about the high school construction program. So I'll leave it to either Pat or Burley to move forward with that and do the introductions. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so this is the third in the third part series um, looking at our bond projects and um, Tyson Watson and Aaron Nostrand from Hol Holting um, are both here to, uh, to talk about those projects in the high school. Um, and Holting has been our construction representative throughout these projects and uh, have uh, managed these projects on our behalf very well. And, and these uh, presentations are a nice summary of, um, of the, the work that's been completed and, uh, and we're nearing the, the finish line of those projects. So with that, uh, Tyson and Aaron, uh, thank you for participating and presenting. Hi, can you hear us? I can, loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, hopefully we can share screen here. 
Just a second. <laughs> Tracy or Hatton might need to make you a co-host for a short period of time so that yep. you can share your screen. She's all set with that. I think she just has to choose to share screen and pick the window you want to share, Erin. Okay, hold on a second. I'm working off of a smaller screen here, so it's just a little hard for me to... No, no problem. <clears throat> Find my screen. Do you see it, Tyson? Um, just click share. Share screen. Yeah. We can see it now. Thank you. Great, great. Hold on just one second while I get our microphone adjusted here and um hey. Okay, uh, I think we're ready to get going. This is Tyson Watson and I've got Aaron Nostrand with me. Thank you for the introduction there, Pat. Um, as Pat mentioned, this is our third and final. We've covered the elementary, we've covered the middle school and, and now we are going to recap our high school projects. So our highest level summary, um, 70 million bond dollars were invested in the high school district. Um, I missed an edit there already right off the bat. There were major improvements to the five high school uh, buildings um, and the stadium, deferred maintenance, technology, safety, and security and capacity were the four primary categories addressed, um, major themes throughout the improvements. And a significant subcategory under deferred maintenance was improving um, heating, ventilation, uh, indoor air quality. Um, so I've got Hellgate up here first. Um, the project was substantially completed at the end of January in 2018, uh, about a two year project. MMW Architects in Missoula was the architect and Jackson Contractor Group also of Missoula was the contractor. Um, <clears throat> the bulleted items are uh, some of the major highlights of the project and then we've got some supporting pictures to go along with it. So. Um, Bullet one, safe, secure, identifiable, identifiable front entry um, and opening up of the interior of the school to be more welcoming. So um, what's kind of pictured on the, on the top picture with the red spires is um, uh, the, new, the new entry that was punched into the existing wall assembly there and the administration area was built out um, immediately to the north of that. And I don't know that we got a picture of it, but when you come through the secure vestibule, um, we demolished a significant amount of walls and exposed the structure um, along with a nice radius wall uh, to really make it um, flowable for the guests coming into the school. Uh, next item is um, we created a new library with new square footage built um, into the mechanical courtyard. And when we relocated the library, uh, we backfilled that with a new, new science rooms up on the third floor and a new FACS room. Uh, also, a uh, night hall was created, which is um, about the size of two normal classrooms. And that lends itself to uh, special educational sessions and, and guest sessions as well. A new kitchen was created and the existing hallway was opened up significantly um, to what we call the dining commons. Uh, it's a flexible breakout space also. The, there was an existing outdoor bridge, which was dilapidated and of course, um, not always great to cross in the wintertime or if it was raining. So that got demolished and um, that's where the building addition was. So now there's a, um, a bridge, but it's indoor. Visual and acoustical improvements to the main gym occurred. Um, also some, some repainting leading into the gym happened um, a couple years ago. Existing spaces were modified um, to, to create some additional classroom spaces, um, some, some more flexible spaces and some um, computer labs also got filled in. Uh, nearly 100% of the existing uh, mechanical system heating and ventilation was replaced with new boilers 
new rooftop units, heating recovery, ventilation units, um, with new digital controls uh, throughout. So indoor air quality was significantly improved at Hellgate High School. And lastly, uh, routes to school were immensely improved, both on the block of Hellgate High School and uh, several blocks around the school, um, partially thanks to the bond money, but also thanks um, to efforts made to secure some transportation grant money. So moving on to the photos, top left is uh, an image of the new kitchen where um, more in the back of the picture in the shadow is where the food is prepared. And those are serving bars uh, that the students uh, snake through to um, choose their meals. Bottom left is uh, the corridor that splits the cafeteria um, to the dining commons on the left and on the right with the cage is uh, the kitchen area, which is closed in this photo. Um, and then other images of the, the new flooring, new wood ceiling, um, lighting, improvements around the windows, just a, a nice refresh of that space. Uh, these are all slides of the new library. Uh, you can see a nice structural steel element to, to really open up that space and, and allow for an open floor plan. Those are called the um, uh, structural trees and nice new furniture with some, an array of soft seating and, and hard seating um, and lots of rooms for um, books and periodicals. What's a little bit more challenging to see is in the bottom left hand corner, but you might be able to recognize four red framed openings and um, through those openings is a um, technology lab, a computer lab. On to the next slide, the top left is the new family consumer science um, space up on the third floor of the, the northernmost part of the building. And top right is the, the corridor um, that leads down to the three new science rooms. Bottom left is a, an image, um, I believe, of one of those science rooms. And then bottom right is also from family consumer science. Uh, this photo is the gym that probably everybody knows. Before we started work, it had a acoustical lay-in ceiling, um, a two by four grid with lay-in ceiling tiles that were prone to being damaged by balls and pretty much anything else that got kicked high enough. So uh, that was taken down and the barrel roof exposed to open it up and um, the barrel roof was lined with acoustical panels. Moving on to Sealy Swan, that was a, a project that got started right at the, the beginning of the bond. Um, and the CTA was the architect on the project. Wadsworth Construction out of Great Falls was the builder. Um, highlighted features of this project are safe, secure, identifiable, identifiable front entry improvements. Um, not shown in, in either of these photos, but um, it, I think it's on the east side of the school, near where the existing front entry was. So a new school and community theater was um, probably the main feature of this project, built off of the existing gymnasium. And improvements were made to the gymnasium so, such that the, uh, the theater would um, function and sound correctly and also look nice. New boiler, um, new unit ventilators in the classrooms and modernized digital controls were, were completed for the project. And similar to all Missoula projects, new cameras, card readers, technology, safety and security um, were also executed for the Sealy High School. All right, now we're moving on to Sentinel High School. This project was just recently wrapped up for its major bond um, designed improvements. Langless and Associates is the general contractor and MMW Architects uh, was the architect. Highlighted features are the new secure front entry, um, vastly improving. Um, we also vastly improve the administration space um, with oversight both on the exterior, but also looking into the, um, the core space and down the hallways of the high school. A new performing arts edition was built alongside the existing Margaret Johnson Theater. Uh, there's nice soundproof, um, sound resistant maybe we should say, pr uh, practice rooms, 
a new band room, support spaces for the for the band and the music programs, a new choir room, um, and improved storage and, and spaces for the drama department as well. Um, what's pictured in the bottom right is um, the east elevation of that performing arts edition and there was also um, some additional paving installed in that area and sidewalks to help facilitate the flow from that um, student parking lot to the front entry uh, whereas before everyone kind of circled around and found ways into the school um, the way they weren't supposed to go. Uh, there is a new theater lighting and sound system installed along with the um, corresponding sound and lighting booth, also new curtains. The STEM edition was um, new square footage built next to the existing shop facilities, the, the wood shop and um, small engines. Significant renovations were done to building 400, which was the um, was and still is the automotive program for the high school district. New computer labs were created in the existing space. A new North Commons area uh, was, was created by knocking down walls near the uh, um, existing and current cafeteria. And a new South Commons was also created um, on the south side of the facility that overlooks the main gym. I forgot to mention, but um, alongside that North Commons in, in that new administration area, um, a new passenger elevator was also installed to um, help with accessibility to both floors. Improvements were made to the main gymnasium by adding um, entire window walls along the east and west elevation above the roof line. And uh, of course, new HVAC was um, also installed to help with ventilation in that space. There's some ongoing work uh, that we just um, awarded uh, well, I, I think it's some of it's on the agenda tonight to improve heating and ventilation to building 500, which is um, part of the Sentinel campus as well, um, as well as the wood shop, small engines and welding um, classrooms. We're going to do some improvements on those ventilation systems. Significant electrical infrastructure improvements along with lighting happened throughout this facility. And again, heating, cooling, ventilation, um, virtually throughout the entire Sentinel complex. One um, kind of unique feature for cooling for Sentinel was um, they had an existing um, water well for, their for one of their irrigation systems and um, it penciled out in this case to use that as a dual benefit also for ground source cooling. So we're getting really close to being able to um, uh, start up that new well and use ground source cooling for, for cooling in that facility. All right, moving on to the photos. On your left, that's the, um, the new North Commons. Um, it's significantly different than what you saw there before. Before it was a, uh, pretty much all walls between those columns with a, um, a, a room um, housed in between. You couldn't see all the way through the windows and into the cafeteria. Uh, so that really opened up the space and, and makes, makes for a good place for student gathering and, and small flexible, um, flexible and breakout spaces. Uh, the top right is the library. I didn't put that into the long list of um, bullet points, but the library was also improved with new heating and ventilation and, and uh, nicer finishes and um, some shades and, and new lighting to, uh, to help with um, being comfortable in that space. The bottom right is the new band room. You can see uh, the, the upper windows um, looking, looking east towards Mount Jumbo and Mount Sentinel. Um, lots of musical instrument storage, sound panels, really neat lighting, uh, just a state-of-the-art space, um, I would say. The top left slide and the top right are images of the um, renovated and improved automotive shop building 400. And the two bottom slides, uh, one's an exterior view looking back at the new STEM edition that was uh, pretty obviously shown there as an infill between uh, the U shape of the existing building. And uh, the, the bottom right is the interior space looking um, south. 
So on the right hand side, that's the wood shop with the old single pane windows and roll up doors between the space and behind the orange wall is um, three classrooms and some open roll up doors to, to be able to wheel projects back and forth. All right. Um, this is uh, Big Sky High School and I neglected to um, add that this project is being um, constructed by Jackson Contractor Group. It was designed by Cushing Terrell, uh, that's a former CTA architects. Um, it is still under construction, but slated to be completed um, this upcoming, uh, at the end of this upcoming summer, uh, early, early fall. So um, a new secure vestibule and reconfigured administration area. Uh, they converted the cafetorium into a dedicated auditorium and added um, audiovisual improvements um, to that, a new speaker system and um, they created a new common, so they infilled uh, what was an existing outdoor courtyard um, adjacent to the library. So they infilled that and um, created the new commons for student eating in the study area. It also contains the um, concessions and coffee cart area. Um, just generally improved some circulation around the school created some specialty classrooms, including flex and fab labs, um, improvements to the um, fax uh, room, pretty much a whole new fax room with um, improved uh, ventilation. Um, gymnasium improvements, so the, all of the floor uh, in the large gym <clears throat> was uh, stripped down to bare wood and um, is being recreated now and, and refinished. New bleachers will be installed, um, paint, uh, sound panels, lighting and air circulation um, features in, in that new gym. We're really gonna enhance that, uh, that space and bring it up to date. Um, as with the rest of the schools, um, improvements to the networking, bells and paging, HVAC controls, um, the voice evac and fire alarm upgrades. There's been um, some roofing work, including the complete replacement of the roof system on the F building, which was the original building at Big Sky High School. Uh, a lot of work's been done, um, investments been made in the mechanical systems. Um, so they had new equipment that was added and then also um, just repairs and um, uh, fine-tuning of existing equipment, um, new filters, those types of things. Um, just recently, the um, large student parking lot, um, which is a really large swath of asphalt that was in really poor repair, um, was uh, demolished by Knife River and is going to be repaved with brand new asphalt paving, um, as well as the staff lot near the F building. Um, along with those site improvements, some ADA um, improvements, just good better access into the building um, are going to be uh, added. Um, really did some nice upgrades to student and staff restrooms. Um, they were just really dated and kind of dark and so that's been improved. Um, the core areas that exist is kind of the uh, back of house areas near the classrooms um, are also being just Im improved um, new skylights being added in those areas and new teacher lounge and planning areas um, and new furniture as well for those things and as well as some new library furniture. So getting into some pictures just realizing this is still um, under under construction so the furniture hasn't been installed and students haven't been able to use or access this area yet but um, this is the new commons there are four um, large pyramidal shaped uh, skylights that bring natural light into the space um, it's just going to be a really awesome um, inspiring space to be in on the bottom left is the concessions and coffee cart area. This is the old cafetorium, which has now been converted into a dedicated auditorium space. Um, you can see in the back behind the furniture that hasn't been unpacked and 
uh, installed yet, um, some retractable seating. So these are kind of similar to bleachers, except they actually have upholstered nice auditorium seating. They're just able to fold in um, and retract. And so that gives that space some adaptability to other types of presentations. Um, on the left is the new ticketing um, window and some new acoustic panel. Again, these are a bit of under construction, but um, the new skylights have been replaced and they're really um, so much nicer than the yellowing um, old original skylight panels. Um, and in the bottom left is a new flex lab that's going to be used um, for their media um, and journalism program. In the center there is some upgrades to the, um, the restrooms and then on the right um, still kind of early in construction, but um, you can see new vent hoods being added into what will be the new uh, culinary space or the fax, I guess, fax room. Um, real preliminary pictures as well of the, um, the gymnasium with the old bleachers taken out, the old suspended ceiling um, removed, uh, new lighting will be added in that space. And then up in the upper right is what the bus loop currently looks like as of today. Um, that uh, will be getting brand new asphalt and then um, just below it is what the current practice field looks like. Um, they removed the uh, sod in that area and they'll be replacing that with new um, base irrigation system and, um, and sod. Um, I'm going to let Tyson speak a little bit more about improvements to the stadium out at the Big Sky campus because I wasn't involved in that uh, <clears throat> project when it happened. Sure. So that one was also uh, a project that commenced right as soon as the bond was approved. Um, they got it largely completed um, within the first summer, but the uh, weather crept in to where the track surface um, coating could not have could not be applied so unfortunately they had to remobilize um, and, and finish that uh, starting in the late spring of 2017 but it's a great facility and um, uh, I think a number of events have already um, been hosted there of, of course along with the um, inner district competitions so in summary ten, a, a new 10 lane track um, was was graded and paved and has the high performance uh, Bainon a rubberized coating, a new play field um, was was installed with synthetic turf and uh, a vastly improved drainage system underneath <laughs> that, new goal posts, um, a nice uh, new scoreboard with, with good incorporated technology for um, uh, track and field events along with uh, football and um, supporting other track um, with, with improved field pits and, and runways. Here. <laughs> so um, these are, are some vastly different photos. Yeah. <laughs> these are some uh, improvements that were made out at the um, the Ag Center out just past Big Sky High School. This was um, the new Ag Processing Kitchen and Meat Lab facility. Um, really uh, innovative program um, developed by the folks out there and supported by the uh, school district. So. In the lower left, you can see uh, kind of their their shoot and um, the area where they uh, kill the animals and then are able to process them, uh, hang them in large coolers and um, teach the kids how to um, butcher and process them into various um, meat products for um, different different uses around the, the district and um, really, really cool um, program there. So um, this is uh, the Willard High School. So a little bit of remembrance of the old building that uh, that stood there that, that was um, torn down actually last summer um, when that was finally completed. And below that is the um, new east elevation of the, the new Willard School. So um, this was built by Sletton Construction, um, designed by Cushing Terrell or CTA. 
um, really an innovative and inspiring new building with lots of uh, abundant natural light. Um, a lot of open concept with group breakout areas and room for student socialization and learning. Um, open concept multi-purpose room, um, which is open to a learning stairs that's used for uh, group presentations where the, the um, school um, meets as a um, whole school for um, different types of presentations. Um, an enhanced central culinary and um, fax type room um, that's open on all sides or with encased in glass really and so um, people can really see what's going on in there. Um, nice art and maker spaces, a student thrift shop, and a comfortable and inspiring library space. So here are some pictures. This is from the top on the left is it from the top of the learning stair um, into the multi-purpose room. There is a large, very, very large garage door which can close down in front of that as well as a big curtain um, to separate those spaces. Um, you can see the uh, kind of cool um, feature stair and learning stair um, in the other pictures. Lots of great innovative um, fun art all throughout the school, kind of a, a, a hip um, interior with exposed mechanicals. And uh, this is the, well, you can see on the left, the glass that encases the fax room. And then this is our cafeteria space and um, space where they can um, sit and study. There's the culinary room um, and then kind of one of the breakout um, spaces and the library on your right. Tons of natural light in there. Um, Kevin, the principal, has spoken many times about the positive effect that that has really had on their student body because the old building was really dark. There's one of the um, science labs and then the new um, basketball court. Um, you can see the solar fence installation, which was not part of the bond, but really a cool feature um, located on the western boundary of, um, of the school, which creates a, um, a fence that's generating power. And that is it. Thank you both. Um, do any trustees have any questions or comments? This is information only. And I'll go to the chat room and see. Sorry, I just need to get it back opened up. It's like Diane has a question. Oh, thank you. Um, Trustee Lorenzen, a question or a comment? Question? I see now. Thank you. I do have a question about the Big Sky High School Auditorium. Can you tell me what the seating capacity of that is for a, a production? Oh gosh, off the top of my head, I think it's around 500. Nice. 480, somewhere in there. It was a, it's a pretty large um, seating capacity within the, the actual retractable bleachers. Um, but then as well, um, it, and this was requested by the um, drama teacher that some additional floor space uh, exists in front of the bleachers because they often do oh, dinner theaters and things like that. So there was additional um, furniture, uh, chairs and, and movable, uh, nice movable tables that were also added in there um, for additional capacity. Any other questions or comments? I'm just checking to see if any hands are raised. Seeing none and seeing no indication in the chat area. Um, this is information only, but any public comment? Once again, I'm checking to see for raised, virtual raised hands or anything in chat. Seeing none, I just want to um, echo Trustee Lorenzen's comment in chat Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you for putting together all the presentations at the elementary level, the middle school level, and the high school level. For I think those new trustees and for members of the public who haven't been able to tour the schools like 
the trustees have been able to do. This has been really helpful so that everyone can see that the bond money was spent meeting the several goals of what was um, identified in the bond. So thank you for increasing safety, security, making sure that the air flows well, making sure that the student spaces are used appropriately. So thank you to Aaron and Tyson and everyone at Holtang. So thanks very Good much for being there. Thank you for letting us speak and we certainly try to keep it brief. We know uh, there's a lot on the agenda for tonight. So thank you as well. Okay, thanks. And so we'll move on to another um, finance and operations topic, which is A2. It's the fiscal year 21 budget update. At this point, it is information only because as Dr. Watson indicated on, in, on August 20th, I believe it was, we will be adopting um, the budgets for the 2021-22 year. So Pat, I'll turn it over to you and I'll go back on mute. All right, thank you. And uh, so from a statutory basis, the uh, um, August 20th is the date by which school districts need to uh, hold their budget adoptions, uh, hearings and meeting and uh, approvals. Um, and then you have uh, five days by August 25th to, to adopt. So uh, um, that's why we scheduled for the 20th. Um, you can hold it earlier, but the 20th for us is the date when we would have reappropriation numbers in place. So that's, that's critical information for, um, for setting, setting budgets. Um, so for tonight, uh, I was just going to sort of preview, um, uh, some of the, some of the spreadsheets we'd be going over or the board would be looking at, um, will likely present, um, additional um, information closer to the budget adoption time, either in, in August or the uh, second meeting in July, that will uh, um, reflect what, uh, what information that you will, you will see um, at, the, at the point of the budget adoption. So um, I know a lot of this is, is review, but um, the page 20 of the agenda provides the projection information at this point, um, the document is uh, a one-page document that includes a column for elementary, a column for high school, and you'll see at the top we're identifying what the uh, what the estimated increase to the general fund budget would be for both the elementary and the high school. Um, the elementary increase would be would be 1.5 million dollars. That increase is based primarily upon um, our enrollment increase. Um, our budget components um, that are statutory are really uh, driven by enrollment, um, A and B, average number belonging. Um, and the high school in comparison has a very minimal increase, $162,000, um, and very much reflective of, of the uh, um, enrollment picture in the high school for this this year. Uh, I also would point out that the uh, budget projections, these numbers are based upon enrollment counts that already happened. So the enrollment counts happen a year in advance of when we set the budgets. Um, so our enrollment in the high school next year, we're anticipating will be better than these numbers that are here would, would, um, would suggest um, for the budget. So it is possible to adopt budget amendments based upon increases in enrollment that change from one year to the next. Um, also, I'll point out on the high school side, there's an overbased levy that's reflected. We did not run an overbased levy, a voted levy, but we can increase our overbased levy if we reduce our permissive levy in other budgeted areas. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so if you go through the uh, page 20 projections, you'll see that in addition to the estimated increase to the general fund, I've also included a uh, retiree savings line item. This reflects um, the savings associated with retirements. So uh, primarily in the certified staff, our teaching staff, um, we, uh, we make this estimate based upon past history of retirements. Um, where the person who retired fit on the salary schedule compared to where the person uh, will, that's hired to replace that person, that the teacher hired to replace the retiring teacher fits on the salary schedule. 
And so you'll see that uh, those numbers are, are estimates, estimates there for elementary and high school. Uh, we have more retirements in the elementary, which is why that number is higher. Um, the, uh, then we have a subtotal of, of available resources to um, cover known costs. And you'll see under salary and benefit obligations, these are estimated costs of uh, staffing costs. Our general fund is about 90% salary and benefits in both districts, uh, a little bit less in the, in the high school, but it's, it's most definitely our operating uh, budget, our operating fund. Um, and, and those increases are reflective of negotiated salary increases and uh, staff moves based upon education. So uh, the, the increases are the 2.25%. Uh, in addition to those increases for staff, um, there's also anticipated additional obligations that are listed under that heading. Um, uh, you'll see a, a number of increased, uh, increased um, expenditures in the elementary. Um, the top two uh, are uh, um, property general liability insurance and then the SRO, CRO um, obligation. Our general liability insurance um, has gone up uh, pretty significantly. Um, this is tied to a couple of things. Um, one is the, the increase in our, in the, our uh, um, space and then the amount of square footage we have to insure um, in our buildings. The other is uh, the values for replacement of the property um, have gone up significantly. And, um, and so that's a reassessment of the, ta the, the, the value of uh, replacement uh, property. We have a number of buildings that are insured. And then third, the uh, overall national market for reinsurance is, is expensive. And so kind of late in the game, our insurance uh, company, uh, Payne West, who manages the pool insurance for a number of districts statewide in Montana, um, got a, a note from uh, from travelers that the that they were pulling out um, they subsequent subsequently uh, bid on the work and are again insuring um, uh, school districts but uh, um, the uh, even with the competitive nature of their bidding the uh, increases were pretty significant as you'll you'll see here that represents about a 17 percent increase to our premium which is which is pretty substantial uh, SRO, CRO, that stands for School Resource Officer, Community Resource Officer. Uh, this is a, also a, a, a larger bump to our expenditure obligation than we were expecting. Um, we were running at about 3% per year, pretty predictably, and, and this is uh, more in the 11 or 15% range. So uh, Dr. Watson and I have a, a meeting schedule with, with the chief. Uh, to have some conversations about that increase. And then uh, on down the line in the elementary, we've uh, the online math iReady uh, program um, is added to the budget. This was not included um, or incorporated in uh, the original um, implementation of the math um, curriculum for the elementary. And, it's, and so that, that um, obligation is reflected there. You'll see a, a number of items, the CPR, co CPR costs for training, AED costs for replacement. These are budget items to, uh, um, that needed to be added to the, to the budget. Um, we have a slight discretionary increase for our K-5 buildings uh, at 4%. They haven't had a, a, an increase for quite some time. Um, the custodial increase is tied to a number of a couple of buildings that have had increased square footage um, and have additional uh, needs based upon number of students and, and, and Jefferson is one of those schools that have seen an increase in the number of our students there with the early kindergarten pro kindergarten program um, middle school cross country we talked a little bit about this uh, um, this would be uh, three coaches one at each middle school um, otherwise participation fees would cover um, other uh, other costs associated with that program. Um, we have a, a, a secretarial boost for our larger K-5 schools. Um, we have some sizable K-5 schools that 
uh, um, uh, could benefit from additional secretarial help, and that's that $60,000 increase here. The 0.5 library um, FTE at Metal Hill is for accreditation. Um, the one FTE fine arts position would be a, a um, roaming position, so it'd create additional opportunities for K-5 staff in terms of um, prep and, uh, and PLC work. The, um, the next two early kindergarten FTE, uh, both certified and para, these positions were initially funded with Title I, so this is a move into the general fund budget for those positions. We uh, now receive um, funding for the students who attend uh, early kindergarten program. That's part of our A and B, uh, average number belonging. And then finally, um, at the bottom of our uh, um, sheet here is where identifying other reductions, offsets, and savings areas to help balance the budget. And, and really, this is mostly impactful on the high school side. Um, where you'll see we're down about 620,000 going into this, this, this section of the spreadsheet. Um, and uh, in the elementary, we're recognizing some position savings, which is a positive, and then also um, utilizing an interlocal agreement um, that uh, is a statutory uh, allowed agreement between two districts um, um, like ours, so we can uh, um, support each district. So here the elementary is supporting the high school district. Uh, in, addition, in addition to that, we're relying upon some one-time only funds, the work comp credit, and then uh, a tuition fund increase for excess special ed costs to help um, address the, the deficit in the element or in the high school. And you'll see we still haven't tackled it entirely, but um, we'll have a strategy for that by the time we adopt our, our budgets, um, including some multi-district support um, through funds we are able to preserve with this year's, this past year's budget. Uh, lots of information to absorb. Um, and I should point out that the, the amount of the property liability insurance increase is slightly less than what's reflected here. So, so it's about um, $15,000 less than what's reflected. So that's, that's a positive on that side. Um, I have a couple more spreadsheets to, to talk about uh, briefly, but before I move on, if, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding these projections. Any questions? Um, it looks like Trustee Decker has a question, and then I'll keep on the lookout for other trustees with questions. Hi. Thanks, Pat. Um, I have uh, just a quick question about um, two and a half FTE secretarial help for the K-5 schools. Right. Larger ones. In particular, I was curious if you could say, I'm sure that the schools are needing a tremendous amount of help to manage everything that they're managing at a distance. I'm curious about what that looks like and which schools are getting that help. So these are schools that whose enrollment, I, I want to say, is about 415 on up, 415 on up to 500. Um, five schools, so you would have uh, uh, Jeanette Rankin, uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, Pax and Rattlesnake Hawthorne, I want to say, are the five. And um, I, I think that, uh, um, that, you know, with those larger schools, based purely on number of students, you have that uh, um, uh, sort of a multiplier of parents and student activity at the front desk. And then um, that, that management obligation that extends um, really to the secretary. They, they do a lot at the schools, um, just a lot involving um, everything from, from helping support the principal with the budget to uh, coordinating pickup, drop off, uh, transportation, substitutes. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing the whole breadth of what they do. So um, really it's, it's trying to provide a little bit of relief in that, in that respect. Any other questions from trustees? Can, can I ask one quick follow-up about that? Yes, go ahead. Um, so as our schools get bigger, there are certain staff positions that are required by their, um, by their size and so on. This isn't required of us at a certain size. This is um, simply about directing some more support there. Exactly, so it's, it's directing support and if you, 
at, at the middle school size, we, in addition to secretaries, have um, have uh, bookkeepers. So the three middle schools will have, I, I want to say, two secretaries and a bookkeeper. So it's not accreditation based, but it's 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 uh, workload based and, and mm -hmm. service based. And Trustee Mercer has a question. Go so I, if I understood this right, that the money trails the actual enrollment by a year. We're transferring this year money from the elementary to the high school. But do you anticipate that's kind of a this year thing and not necessarily an ongoing? It's, it's because there's a lag between the money and enrollment increasing at the high school in part? Yeah, it, it, it's a um, it, great question. So the, um, yes, we're anticipating this would be a, a one year deal because it looks like there's a, a good class coming into the high school that would be counted next year. The other piece is that um, um, it's very much enrollment driven, as, as you mentioned. So the budgets are, are uh, um, affected pretty significantly by enrollment. Um, and there's some slides uh, that we have on their website um, and that we share with the trustees in their handbook. It's also on the website, just kind of showing in graph format the, the link between enrollment and budget. Um, and, and then what we'll do with this support from the elementary is, is we'll not rely upon that in the high school unless we absolutely have to. So um, when we've supported one district with this interlocal uh, fund, um, it, we've only utilized it when we've had to utilize it, which means uh, to the extent we can keep that fun, those funds in the elementary, then, then we will. This is just a, um, uh, the support we need to get keep the high school programming in place and intact. Does that answer your question, Trustee Mercer? Yes, thank you. Thanks. I'm looking to see if any other trustees have questions. I'm not seeing any other. Oh, Trustee Decker has one, one additional question. Go ahead, Trustee Decker. Sorry, thank you. Um, so I, I remember, I think the list of schools that you listed, none of those were title schools. Is that right? So, That's correct. And, and this essentially um, is a, um, adding up to a half-time secretarial position at our five non-title schools? Is it- Well, a, actually Hawthorne is among in the, the schools. Yeah, yeah Hawthorne, Hawthorne was is there. a title school, yeah. So, but there's five schools, and so this is a half-time position at each of the schools. Correct. Yep, 10 month half time position at each of the schools. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Chair Holland, can I make one more comment? Sure, go ahead. Dr. So uh, I think uh, Trustee Decker's questions are excellent questions around the secretarial issue. It is not a uh, accreditation requirement. We're also not required to have school nurses, surprisingly. Um, that's not a, related to accreditation either, but we all know that, that they're desperately needed. But um, secretaries are distributed based on need um, and size and responsibility and duties. Um, what, what you're seeing here is uh, one of the uh, priorities for me as I came into the district and talked with um, the secretaries and the principals at the K-5 level. What I found out is that um, at lunchtime, specifically around that lunch hour. Um, it was very difficult to manage the front office, plus give the secretary a break, plus do everything else. So um, I would like to eventually have part-time secretaries in every elementary school. This is a stepping stone to get to that long-term goal. Any other trustee questions? I do have one, Pat. When you indicated in, so this is general fund only. I mean, there are, as you're, I think we're about to hear about, there are multiple sources of revenue that support our programs, et cetera. So the early kindergarten and early kindergarten para, since they're moving from Title I and being go going to be captured by the general fund budget, would that mean those amounts remain available to Title I for any Title I schools? Because this is elementary side? Yes, that's exactly right. 
And I'm not waving to you. I'm just trying to get my lights on. Sorry. Okay. I, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So those those funds would be freed up in the the Title One program for the elementary side. Okay. Thanks. And any other questions? Not seen any. Then Pat, I don't know if you have want to cover the additional items that are um, getting on twenty one, et cetera. You bet. So um, page page 21 uh, identifies the various revenue sources for our general fund. And um, if you look at the top part of that, that page, that's uh, the elementary general fund uh, comparing our uh, uh, this year, this past year, 2020 against the projected 2021 budget and where the additional revenue is, is being derived. And um, from uh, if you go on the left side, it lists the various components, and these are all linked to the the school funding formula. And if you go down about five spots, you'll see the base levy and the over base levy. Only those two items are um, those two categories are both uh, um, local taxpayer levied amounts, and and you can the, the rest are. Um, state funding uh, components and supported through state funding. The, uh, if you look at the, the base levy and the over base levy, uh, the over base levy was zero um, and that's the portion of our budgets that are voted, um, the over base portion. And then the base levy amount uh, went down and that amount went down because the state funding picked up a greater portion in guaranteed tax base aid uh, as one one area. So the bottom summary just kind of identifies the number of mills we're anticipating levying. And then we'll talk more about this when we dot budgets. But at this point, we're saying in the general fund in the elementary, we had, a, we had levy eight fewer mills. And that's based upon the current taxable value of, uh, of uh, 1,029,495. Uh, that's reflected down below. And we, we anticipate that value will go up, which means our mill values will go up and our number of mills will, will, will go down. Uh, that means a lower tax burden to the taxpayers. On the high school side, um, it's a similar picture. Um, and then you can see here on the high school side, also the A and B is 38 less than what it was the prior year. So that's a lower enrollment number in the high school and that's having this, this impact on our high school budgets, which we hope will reverse itself next year when we, when we do our enrollment counts in the fall and then again in the spring. Um, the next several pages, um, uh, when we talk about different buckets of funds for a school district, you'll see this breakdown here. Um, and again, this is all on our website under business services. But the uh, uh, on the left, we identify the type of budgeted fund. Um, the first is the general fund. And, and you'll see the numbers that are listed there is the uh, existing budget adoption for those uh, uh, for the general fund. And then the funding source is a mixture of state and local funding, um, it's it's uh, levied, levied uh, locally, and um, and then the purpose it it funds the operational costs of the district, and then there's some examples to the right. And as mentioned, salaries and benefits are are ninety percent, but you'll see utilities and materials make up the the other ten percent. Um, transportation is another fund, and this is only for to and from transportation. It's funded through a local permissive levy, but also with the state and county uh, contribution. Uh, this uh, fund supports our contract with Beach, uh, also supports some salaries related to transportation and then our routing software. Um, the tuition fund is a permissive levy. It's, it's a, it funds um, both the detention center, students at the detention center, but also excess special ed costs. And that's a, a new feature uh, in state law um, that, we've, that we've utilized the last couple of years. Um, on to the next page, page 23. 
The retirement fund is a countywide levy, and this covers the cost of staff um, uh, fringes, primarily the contribution to the retirement system. And then the other items are listed, Social Security and Medicare taxes. Um, adult education, uh, we have both elementary and high school, very small amount in the elementary and a large amount in the high school. Um, and again, for instruction, 16 years of age and older at the adult, um, for students who are not in, in our public schools. Uh, technology is also a budgeted fund. We had a, have a voted levy that uh, is an ongoing levy. Uh, in the elementary, it's 850,000. In the high school, it's 750,000. That's reflected here. Um, and uh, that's a significant um, uh, deal for our district. It helps maintain our equipment uh, and our software. And you'll see that's a significant piece to the expenditures out of that fund. There's a flexibility fund, which we don't utilize, uh, but that's also one of the budgeted funds. And then on, on page uh, 24 and 25, you'll see the non-budgeted funds. Oh, I'm sorry, page 24, the, the remaining two budgeted funds are debt service and building reserve. Um, we do not currently have an active building reserve. Um, those expired uh, in 2016 and 2015 in the elementary and 2018 in the high school. Um, and the debt service um, fund is where we uh, levy um, um, to support the debt obligation associated with our bonds. So that, that's primarily principal and interest payment. It's like uh, uh, our mortgage payment uh, at home, but that's what we levy is to support that obligation. And we'll talk some more about that when we get closer to the budget adoption, but um, we have a number of uh, this past year and then this upcoming year, we've had uh, a couple of refunded bonds on the high school that are falling off the table. So those will result in some pretty sizable savings to our taxpayers is about $700,000 that won't be levied for those debt service obligations. And finally, on page 26, compensated absences uh, is a separate non-budgeted fund, as is health insurance. And you see the health insurance trust fund report uh, to support our insurance program. Um, the compensated absence is a allowed funding source for termination pay. It helps us build up funds to support um, the obligation to staff at retirement, primarily. Um, that's a, also a pretty sizable obligation at retirement. So. Um, just a, a brief taste and look. I invite you to look at our um, at the website with the various other graphs and information. There's also a, 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 the document that we shared with the board a, about a month ago um, um, regarding uh, the uh, uh, other components of the school funding and some good links to OPI and other sources to to further dive into the school funding formula if you're if you're so interested. <laughs> That's all I have. And so um, Trustee Service has a question. Is the August budget meeting the August 18th meeting or the August 20th meeting? I'm not sure where the 18th came from, but let me double check. I'm, I'm asking this because um, we say it's, the agenda says that it's Tuesday, August 20th, but actually August 20th is a Thursday. So I just want to know which day it is that week. Thank you. Yes, that's Thursday, Thursday, August 20th. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that's thank good. you. Yep, that's a good catch. Thank you, Trustee Sturbis. It is usually, as you'll notice on Thursdays, just because it gives um, Pat and his office the most time to come in with the most accurate information. Um, and keeps us within the statutory um, time limit. So, and once we start adopting the budget on Thursday the 20th, if for some reason there are some additional questions or information needed, then we can meet after that because we've started the process. Is that correct, Pat? That's, that's correct, yep. We can extend it from day to day for five days if necessary. Okay, thanks. Any questions for Pat on the second portion of his um, information presentation? I'm looking, I'm not seeing any hands up or any indication in chat. I didn't, as I had indicated with the prior presentation, is this information only? Is there any public comment? 
Again, I'm checking. I don't see any indication of public comment on this information item. So we'll face Pat for, to you and all your office. Um, you know, funding how school boards fund their school districts is a complex, incredibly complex process. So thank you for trying to present it in the simplest terms that is possible, which is not, which is a big challenge, but thank you so much for giving us the update ahead of the actual budget adoption meeting. You bet, thank you. And then we move on to number three, which is to discuss the potential lease of the unleased portion of Cold Spring Elementary. And Pat, this is on you. And perhaps for the benefit of the new trustees, um, you could just kind of briefly capture what the other part of Cold Springs Elementary is being rented out for. So why this is captioned the unleased portion. Yes, thank you. So um, page 27 um, is, a, is a sort of rough diagram of Cold Springs School. And um, the, the bottom of the page is actually facing north. And the, uh, the, the heavily shaded area or outlined area is what's currently leased right now to uh, Mark Roberts. And um, it's being leased for early child, childhood uh, services, child care services. And um, the portion that's, that's unleased is in uh, uh, as a jagged line as its boundary. And, um, and it doesn't quite include all of the remaining space. The historical school building that's at the northernmost end, that uh, bottom part of the page, would remain un unleased under this uh, proposal. So uh, the proposal is reflected in the, the background section is to use that space for a, a dance studio. Studio M approached, approached the school district about uh, using some space. Um, they're pleased with the space that, uh, that was here at Cold Springs, including the location. Um, and the uh, space that would be leased is likely more than what they would need, but it's really not possible to break that space up into chunks very easily um, and still have access. So that section there would have access. And, um, and then I, I think that, uh, that the proposed tenant would look at, at subleasing uh, a portion of the space uh, to another dance studio. So um, the, uh, this information has been shared with Mark Roberts, the, the tenant on the remaining space, and uh, he certainly finds that it's a compatible use with his use um, as the dance studio serves children ages two to 18 and, uh, and could be a, um, a beneficial um, partnership between those two, two tenants. And uh, as indicated in the, the background write-up, this is information only, the tenant would really like to get into the space by August 31st. So what we would anticipate doing is sharing with the board a, a lease agreement. It would look uh, very much like the one that uh, the board looked at for the other Cold Spring space, um, including the price per square foot at, at $3. And, um, and we would share that at, at the next available board meeting, uh, ideally. So uh, um, I think that's, that's uh, all the information I had to share. Thanks, Pat. It also looks like there's a representative from Studio M participating in the meeting. I didn't know if any trustees have any preliminary questions since this is information only at this time, but if, it, if you have questions, um, so that the, you know, the representative Studio M would know what any questions or concerns are, that would probably be quite helpful. Any questions from any trustee or any comments? I'm not seeing any, so any public comment on this item? And I can read this if you'd like. It's from Megan Hensley Shapiro, who's the owner. Um, her public comment is, thanks so much for your consideration. We are excited about the potential of this space for our studio. 
So thank you for that public comment. And as Pat indicated, once the terms of a proposed lease are um, in a more final form, we'll be coming back to this as an action item. So thank you so much, Pat. And you bet, thank you. With that, we'll continue on the agenda. The next three items look like we're going to be seeing some of these still early, which appear to be um, items that could have been covered with bond money, but were kind of held out. And then when we see how much bond money is available, there are some additional improvements that we would like to make. So the first one is to award a bid for Paxton Elementary School cooling addition. So this is a K-12 elementary action item. So Billy, Burley, sorry, I'll turn it over to you. And I, I think uh, if it's okay, I'll, uh, I'll pinch hit for Burley. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I saw him in the meeting, but maybe he didn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so the, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks Chair Holland. The, uh, e exactly right. These are some projects that we, we sat on uh, to make sure that we, uh, um, we, we hit all of the school buildings and we had a, a few that we could come back to. And, and uh, this one and the next one are both upgrades or updates to the cooling uh, um, availability at Paxson and at Chief Charlotte. At Paxson, it would only support the upstairs, but it's, it's uh, stifling um, in the upstairs of Paxson a certain time of year. And so the uh, recommendation is that we award this uh, bid to 4G's Plumbing and Heating um, in the amount of $91,000 to be funded with bond proceeds. Any questions for Pat? Just checking. I'm not seeing any, so is there a motion from a K-12 trustee to award 4G plumbing and heating with the cooling addition project at Paxson Elementary in the amount of $91,215 subject to successful negotiations of a contract? And trustee Old Person has made such a motion. Is there a second? And Trustee Lorenzen has seconded the motion. Any um, trustee discussion? I'm not seeing hands up or any indications. Any public comment? Seeing none. Then um, all elementary K-12 trustees in favor of the motion to award 4G plumbing and heating with the project, um, please indicate by raising or by typing in yes into the chat. Just I'm checking. And it looks like it's unanimous as to all K-12 trustees. So thank you for that. And then Pat, are you taking um, the lead on the bid for Chief Charlotte Elementary School cooling edition also? Yes. Okay, thanks. So uh, similar to the uh, Paxson upgrade, um, this would provide cooling for Chief Charlotte School and um, at about the same cost, but the benefit of Chief Charlotte is that their system was uh, able to, to work or the upgrade was able to work for the entire school building. So in, uh, not just the, uh, the upper floors, but the main floor would, will benefit from, from this upgrade. And, um, and also we're requesting the award to 4G's uh, plumbing and heating and in the amount of 97,215. Any questions for Pat? Not seeing any indication of questions from the trustees. Is there a motion from a K-12 elementary trustee to award 4G plumbing and heating with the cooling addition project at Chief Charlotte in the amount of $97,215 subject to successful negotiations of contract? It's been moved by trustee Abgaris and seconded by trustee Lorenzen. Is there any board discussion? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, then all K-12 elementary trustees in favor of the motion, please indicate by typing in yes or a Y into chat.
and it looks, let me double check. Yes, the motion has passed um, unanimously. And then we move on to six, which is slightly different in the funding source. So Pat, did you want to explain this too? Or is it Burley? It's still you, right? It's, it's me, yes. Um, so this is that uh, the great project up at Sealy where we're replacing the piping. It's, it's funded, uh, as Chair Holland mentioned, from uh, uh, not from the bond, but from a Department of Commerce grant, a delivering local assistance grant. And um, we uh, have the, the project designed um, and, and this is uh, the result of uh, bidding for plumbing services. So that's uh, the primary work that would be performed. Um, the, the, the bid that's, that we're recommending um, to the board is to um, Williams uh, Plumbing and Heating in the amount of $197,000. And uh, the amount of the grant is 400,000. So um, we're able to perform all of the work we are hoping to with grant proceeds, which is, which is great. And um, like the other bond projects, Holting is uh, um, representing us on this project and, and managing this project for us. And, and so uh, really pleased with this, with this bid and recommending that uh, the trustees uh, award it to, to Williams Plumbing and Heating. Any questions from any trustees? I'm not seeing any others. I have one, Pat. I'm assuming that we go ahead and pay, um, just try to, um, Williams Plumbing, and then it's reimbursable out of the grant and that any unspent monies just we don't receive from the grant but if there's a little bit of over costs we've got a pretty good cushion on because of the size of the grant it's exactly right and and the benefit of this bid is that we're we're able to uh to incorporate some some alternates that fit within the grant ask um including some filtration systems some uh water heaters so it's it's going to be a, um, a, an enhanced version of the piping replacement that we were hoping for so Tyson is is project managing those pieces on our behalf and and uh, um, I think it's going to be uh, to, going to be great to have that that upgrade thanks any other questions based on mine not seeing any then is there a motion to award Williams Plumbing and Heating with the water pipe and fixture project at Sealy Swan High School in the amount of $197,300 subject to a successful negotiation of contracts? It's been moved by Trustee Sturbus and seconded by Trustee Abgaris. Is there any board discussion or comment? I'm not seeing any others, I just want to thank whoever had the foresight to apply for this grant and, mm -hmm. and do so in a way that it was actually um, awarded to us. If you can, if that was, you were involved with that, but if you can pass along the thanks from me and the board for doing so, because this, this is you know, really a, a very wise thing to have had the foresight to do. Yeah, thank you. I was really happy we got it um Kara Tortorich my assistant and I did the took a gamble and, <laughs> and with the support of the superintendent uh, both Rob and Mark when he was here so it was it was great that uh, it was it was awarded so it, it fit within the request so that's great yep and thanks thank and pass the thanks along to Burley too for his involvement as well I see that Dr. Watson indicated he was involved in it as well so thank you to all of you folks you bet. Thank you. It looks like there's public comment, and there is one from Tyson from Holtang. And if you want, Tyson, I can read it for you, or you can read it to yourself, whichever you prefer. Okay, so um, Tyson indicated, Tyson, let me jump back to make sure I've got his 
last name right, Tyson Watson from Holtang, and the company is H-U-L-T-A-N-G, has um, made public comment. Great work to Pat, Burley, and Kara for submitting that info for the DLA grant. There was tremendous competition statewide. So public comment from um, Tyson. Any other public comment? Seeing none, then all trustees in favor of the motion to award Williams Plumbing with um, the project at Sealy Swan, please indicate by typing in yes. I'm just double checking and trustee. Um, Bobo is yes. Thank you. It's just mm -hmm. about to ask. Thanks so much. And it appears that it is. Um, the motion passed unanimously as to all trustees present. Then we move on to B, which is personnel negotiations and policy. And that um, this month, it's the report that we see each month, which is to approve the personnel report found beginning on page 28. Is there anything you'd like to um, note about this month's personnel report, Dave? No, it is a routine report. Okay. Any questions? And as the trustees know, we don't comment on specific individuals, but if you have any general questions. See none. Then is there a motion to approve the personnel report? Not, oh, there we go. So trustee Lorenzen has um, so moved and seconded by trustee Abgaris. Is there any public comment? I'm sorry, is there any trustee comments first? Any public comment? Seeing none, then all trustees in favor of the motion to approve the items on the personnel report, please indicate by typing in yes. And trustee Vogel? Vogel is, um, Vogel is a yes. Thank you. So it appears that motion passes unanimously as to all trustees present. Then we come to um, two items of old business, or I guess items under, just under, continuing under old business for personnel negotiations and policy. And so one is the MCPS return to school. Again, it's explained in the agenda, this is information only, but the district is seeking feedback and especially, you know, including feedback from the trustees. So um, Dr. Watson, if you want to um, give us your, the, the current update. And it looks like he's working on sharing his screen, I'm guessing, there we go. Uh, hopefully, if I shared my screen correctly, you should see a picture of a school bus. Yes, I can see it, so I'm thinking everyone else can. Okay. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to take a few minutes and uh, go over some uh, information that we learned about remote learning. I think it probably helps to frame this conversation a little bit about the restart. So um, I, I shared some of this data the other day um, in a presentation at City Club, but I do think it's relevant. There's not a not very many slides, but I think it's important for the board to have some of these numbers in mind as we think about the restart. So um, just, just really quickly, um, when we got to the end of remote learning and sort of tallied up all the numbers, uh, we handed out about 1,500 computers or devices needed to do remote learning, uh, 125 hotspots, which allowed families to get um, needed internet access. The lunch delivery thing was probably the most um, incredible thing that, that I can report. So beach transportation with their help, 57 days of lunch and breakfast, over 92,000 meals served. Well, 92,000 bags of food, but that included lunch and breakfast for the next day. So that's just a tremendous um, turnout for our lunch program. And just to remind the board that that wasn't necessarily just MCPS students. Remember that meal program was opened open to any student under the age of 18. Uh, let's see, figure out how to advance my slide. So um, I think it's important too to point out that as, as the summer has progressed, 
uh, we're reading some national research regarding uh, impacts of remote learning. Um, I, we haven't, we don't have any uh, district research yet because um, what we were waiting for was once we restarted the school year that we would be able to um, do some diagnostic testing on students to see sort of that learning loss over remote learning. But we, we, we are reading some national research and let me tell you how this was done. So this national research um, organization, they basically, this is a predictive model and they basically used a couple of um, samples that they had already had. So one of the samples was um, from uh, Hurricane Katrina when the school shut down in that part of the country. And um, there was some learning loss, obviously, that was impacted by Hurricane Katrina and massive school shutdown. So that was one of the pieces of data that they used. They also used some data from weather related shutdowns. So when you know school districts across the country, not like Montana, but other school districts that go into days and days of shutdown because of severe weather, they use some of that predictive data to, to arrive at what they expect might be the learning loss with, with COVID-19. And um, I wanna just put these in perspective for you. So traditionally in the summer months, we experience a summer learning loss, um, also known as the summer slide in some cases, but traditionally we've, we've seen that and that's been researched over time that there is a learning loss over the summer. Ironically, just because we're out of school for two and a half months, that's not necessarily, that doesn't equate to two months or two and a half months worth of learning loss. Typically in a typical summer, the learning loss is about 30 to 45 days, um, depending on if it's reading or math and depending on the grade level. But in general, what you'll find for most of the research is that the learning loss for the summer months is usually about a month or a month and a half. Um, but what, what they're predicting for, for uh, the COVID-19 remote learning um, time that students were out of school is that in reading, we can expect a loss of about three months. Um, and in math, maybe up to five months worth of, worth of loss over, over the COVID um, period of time. And then the last thing that, that they've researched and pointed out is that students are gonna come back at, at really different rates um, because some students obviously had more access and more engagement during remote learning than other students. So we know students will come back in at much different rates. There have been, um, there haven't been a lot of studies on the impacts of mental health, but one thing I found interesting is that um, nationally, those students that have mental health services, about 57% of them receive them at school. So, you know, not being in school obviously has an impact on that. And then what, they, what they're um, telling us is that when kids come back, you know, we really have to pay attention to these three things. We're still involved in a public health crisis. There has been a period of social isolation. And then of course, we, we could be entering in or already are in an economic recession, which has impacts on mental health. So that's some, some sort of the national research we've been reading about learning loss and mental health with regard to remote learning. Um, we also surveyed, we did two surveys, one with parents and one with teachers or staff members. These surveys were done um, in June, uh, the first two weeks of June. So I just wanted to point out that uh, we are looking at new, doing another survey, a sort of an abbreviated survey that's a little more specific, but we intended this survey to sort of just guide some of our understanding around remote learning and, and things that we learned. So you can see some of the stats here from our parents, about 30, 38% said they were either satisfied or very satisfied with remote learning. There was also a big chunk of people that marked neutral on that question. So, um, and then there were some that were dissatisfied or, or very dissatisfied, obviously. 46% um, reported high levels of stress with remote learning. 45% had have health and safety concerns with, uh, with return to school. 60% um, were confident uh, in the school to develop a plan. I do wanna note that again, that, uh, on all of these, there's a chunk of people that marks neutral. 68% agree that they plan to send their child back, but 25% marked neutral, so not really sure what they're gonna do at the time of the survey. So that's some information from parents. Um, corollary here, a little more information from teachers and staff, 59% um, worry about the impact of COVID-19 on their health, 53% express high level of anxiety due to COVID-19. 45% are confident in a safe and healthy return. However, 28% were neutral in that question as well. 
um, and 66% were confident that they can return in the fall. So um, those survey results um, were also emailed out in a link format to our staff yesterday and our parents today. So, and we'll have those on the website as well. Um, what, what we're reading about returning to school, what we need to focus on, um, just related to some of the academic and, and mental health issues, focusing on relationships with our students, understanding the impacts of trauma. Um, with regards to academics, what we can do right away is some diagnostic checking, as I mentioned, determine how much extra support might be needed or how much extra time we should spend reviewing previous year. So those are just some, some guidelines we've been reading about the return. And then the last part here is really related to our return. And I, I want to go through this slide, but also show you our return to school draft plan just to give you a sense of what we're thinking. So um, we, we, we are committed to some, some type of in-person learning, uh, not committed to any specific schedule yet, but definitely committed to, to having some sort of uh, in-person learning uh, when school starts up again. Um, we, we do have a few programs starting early. So in August, we'll have a ramp up program, which is basically a, a restart program for a smaller group of kids. We've asked our principals um, to identify some kids that would benefit for some, from some extra time. And so we're talking about really small groups, probably eight to 10, no more than eight to 10 students per teacher um, in, each, in each building, maybe three to four to five groups of those kids. Um, but, but coming back um, early for a couple of weeks, half day program, optional program, obviously not required by students, but we're trying to target kids that will really, um, that would really be helpful for. We have some protocols in place. Those protocols are changing as we're getting more guidance from the health department. There are limits to group size. And also we had a conversation today with a county health officer who's really encouraging us to look at the limiting of mixing of groups. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how we're um, recommending that. Limiting school visitors, uh, quite frankly, because the transmission between adults seems to be happening more often. So really limiting the adult visitors to the school. Um, and then uh, working on a remote learning plan, an option for those students who cannot attend. And I've just been talking to a lot of folks about remaining flexible and adaptable. Um, in this um, in this COVID-19 um, session. So let me um, exit there and see if I can pull up one other document for you. Uh, so hopefully you can see this document. It's uh, the restart document um, sort of what, what parents and, and staff can expect. Um, this was also in the board packet. Um, this was also emailed yesterday to staff and today to parents. Uh, this is a draft. Um, we're still talking with the county health officer about this phasing idea, this phasing plan. Um, but I, the reason that I put the phases in there, I'm trying to match the phases from the state so as you're well aware, the state is in phase two right now. Um, but I wanna remind folks that just because the state is in phase two doesn't mean that our county necessarily will remain in phase two. Uh, the county health officer can always add extra restrictions onto the governor's restrictions. So a good example of that is the recent um, face mask uh, order that was passed by the county health board. That's an example of a restriction that's been put in place in our county that's more restrictive than just what's in phase two. So um, as we go along and as we watch case counts um, go up and down and um, as the county health officer and her team do the contact tracing and their ability to do contact tracing, we will likely have more restrictions or less restrictions from the county health officer. So it'll be really important for us to stay in communication with her and as we move along through these different phases. Um, under phase one, if we had uh, restrictions around group size, what we're recommending is sort of a blended model. I'm calling it a hybrid model. So some school and some remote learning. So um, uh, several schedules have been discussed. Our staff seem to 
land on this schedule where we'd have half the students in, in attendance Mondays and Tuesdays and the other half of students in attendance on Thursdays and Fridays, using Wednesday as a day to clean the school, but also perhaps add extra time for some of our special education students who need you know, more, more contact obviously with teachers. So using Wednesday as sort of a flexible day for, for that. But um, this would be our, our, our recommendation if we were in, in this phase one or restriction to group sizes that we would do a blended model of some on-site and some remote learning. Under phase two, um, we are uh, suggesting that we would have on-site learning every day for all students. Um, however, I've, I'm calling it a modified school model because it's not a traditional school model. It's very much not a traditional school model, even though we'd have students there every day. Um, what we would be looking at is a reduced schedule, a shortened schedule for the day, and I can explain why we're looking at that. Um, but specifically, um, I put the times at the bottom of this document. We'd be looking at tentative times right now. K-8 would be 8.25 to 2 o'clock, 6.8, 8, 8 a.m. to 1.30, high school 10 a.m. to 3.30. There's a couple of specific reasons that we're recommending a shortened day or a reduced schedule. The first reason is for busing purposes. Um, we believe that it'll, it'll help with our busing models to stagger the start time. So uh, that's one particular reason. So what we'd like to do is um, pick up the middle school kids first, then give, our, give time to clean the buses before we pick up the uh, elementary kids and those sorts of things. So again, that's part of the reason for the staggering is for busing and for cleaning of the buses. The other reason for the staggering of the start times or reduced day is to allow for us to clean the school, um, either before school or after school, a, a thorough cleaning to make sure that we're ready for students either for the next day or before they arrive. The other reason we're recommending a reduced day is to give our teachers time to plan um, because once the students are in school, uh, we want to make sure that we're, you know, we've got 100% um, teacher-student interaction during that whole time that they're there. So we need to build in some planning time for our teachers either before school or after school. Um, we are we are exploring a, a number of different school schedules to to really zero in on the um, on the limit limited mixing of of groups. And so I want to talk briefly through a couple of those. So. Obviously, when, when we look at trying to keep cohort groups of kids together, it's much easier to do at elementary. We've talked to our elementary principals about what that would look like, keeping kids in the classroom as much as possible in a cohort group. Um, you may have times when uh, another teacher will come in to provide sort of those electives or exploratories or what we call specials at K-5. But really K-5 is much easier to keep a cohort group together, um, eating lunch in the classroom, going out to recess as a cohort group, those sorts of things we've talked about at K-5. At middle school and high school, our traditional school model is that kids rotate through a schedule. They may have eight classes in a day or seven classes in a day, depending on what level they're at or what school. Um, so what we're recommending at middle school and high school in order to limit the mixing of groups is a, uh, what I'm calling an intensified block schedule. So it's different than the block schedule at Big Sky or the modified block schedule at Sentinel. An intensive block is really students would stay in a class for an extended period of time until they pretty much finish the material from that class before they move on to the next class. So um, U of M Western has an intensive block schedule. That's something they've done for a number of years. It's kind of where we got the idea. What we're suggesting is that um, there would be no more than two groups per day. So they would only transition once. So they have one group in the morning and a different group in the afternoon. They would stay in that class for an extended period of days, um, anywhere from 16 to 30 days. And then once they're finished with that class, they would move on to the next class for the next 16 or 30 days. So those are just some models we've been exploring. There's no perfect example out there. There's some give and take that'll happen with any of these models. I will tell you that what, one thing I've told our staff on several occasions is this is not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be what we're used to. Imagine at the high school level, level if you're taking a semester's worth of material 
and, and, and smushing it into 30 days, even though you'll have the students longer for each day, trying to squish a semester into a reduced amount of time, obviously is gonna be difficult for, for all of us. So it's not perfect and it, and it won't be like we've experienced before. It won't be like we're familiar with, but it goes back to what I was talking about before, remaining flexible and adaptable and doing the best we can under the circumstances and hope that you know maybe by second semester, maybe by um, next fall, we'll get back to more, more of a normal, normal traditional schedule. Um, so that's kind of and just some things we're thinking about for the modified schedule. Um, we've talked to several staff groups. I will continue to do that over the next few weeks as we start to um, really <clears throat> refine our draft and get it down to a final model. And then obviously if we're in phase three, it would be more of a traditional school model. Um, and again, even if the state were to move into phase three, we may or may not decide to do that as a community or as a district. One thing I do know about the modified schedule is once we start that, we're gonna have to do it for the whole semester just to get through the, the seven or eight classes. So um, we've explored options for Big Sky being on an eight period day and, and looking at that, we've explored options for Sentinel and and Hellgate looking at their seven periods versus going back to a six period um, rotation. So we've looked at all the options and we'll continue to um, talk with principals and talk with teachers to really refine that into a better model. So that's just some general things I'm, I'm, I wanted to share with the board about um, what our planning is so far. The last thing I would just share is the timeline. So we're in this period right now of trying to get information out about what school will look like. Um, I understand that it may change quite a bit over the next few weeks, um, but we do intend to survey our parents again. And the question we're gonna ask on the survey, likely the last week of July or the first week of August, the questions we'll be asking is, here, here's what the model looks like. Will you be sending your student back or are you looking for a remote learning option? Um, so that'll help us plan a little bit better how many students we might have that are are strictly in remote, 100% remote learning versus how many students will be coming back. Um, those are some of the things we're working on. Um, we hope to have sort of a finalized um, best guess um, the first week of August. So we'll be able to report that out at the August board meeting. But um, this, this next two weeks or so is pretty important just to gain feedback from our community and from our parents and our teachers. So I will stop there and um, pause and see if the board has comments, questions, or suggestions. And let me get back. Any, um, Trustee Sturbis has a question, I believe, and then I'll look for more questions after that. Trustee Sturbis? Yeah, so I was wondering um, what's been done so far for planning for remote learning, because no matter what, that's gonna be part of it. Yeah, thanks for the question. We have a committee that's working on remote learning at all three levels. I can tell you it looks a little bit different at K-5 versus middle school versus high school. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples, um, at, at K-5, we've got teachers that are, and, and principals that are working on, um, on a uh, remote learning platform so that students, uh, um, if they decide to do 100% remote learning, that platform will be up and running on the first day. Um, it'll be very similar, likely, to what they experienced last spring in terms of it's asynchronous. They're not, they're not communicating with a teacher you know, every hour of the day that we'll have some teachers that will be dedicated to the remote learning module and they'll be checking in with kids, but it'll be asynchronous. Um, at middle school and high school, we've explored some other options for remote learning. So there are some uh, companies out there that can provide some content for us so that we don't have to rebuild the content. So that's one of the things we're exploring right now is using some, some of our CARES Act money to, to, to purchase some content so, and purchase a platform so that kids can start in that right away um, at the start of the semester if they decide to go into remote learning 100%. Um, we will also have teachers at the middle school and the high school that will act as facilitators. So a student is not just doing that on their own. They'll, they'll be a facilitators helping them through that process. Um, and so those are some, just some things we've been exploring with remote learning. So just a follow up, if uh, we have to go all into 100% remote learning, 
will they these facilitators help the other teachers get back into this yeah so one of the th that's a great question i'm glad you asked that one of the things that we're going to ask teachers do is is really start from day one just be ready for that because you know if we're starting in this module this hybrid module where we've got kids in school for a couple of days and then kids are out of school for the rest of the week they're going to have to be doing some remote learning when they're not in school so teachers are really sort of going to be starting in that on day one they're going to have their in-class material but they're also likely to have some um some material ready to go for remote learning in case and it will also work in case we have to go into 100 percent remote learning the other thing i forgot to mention is we've um purchased enough devices now that we believe that um we can almost have a one-to-one -one situation in middle school and high school so that'll be a lot easier for teachers to float in and out of remote learning knowing that a kid is accessing the material from home so that's something i think that that will be better this year Thank you. And Trustee Decker has a question. Thanks. Um, my question is about the assumptions that we're using in driving toward our planning. Um, and I'm curious if you would talk a little bit about what the team that got started with the planning back in you know, May and June, what some of the kind of baseline assumptions were around what each phase might be looking like and what, um, you know, because because starting from the, the the reason why I'm asking the question is that our assumption seems to be that everyone in the classrooms is going to be the best, like we'd like that situation. Um, and uh, and we're, so we're not planning for the worst case scenario right now. The assumption to me feels like we're planning for a best case scenario. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little more about that and whether those assumptions still feel like they're the right ones to be working with. <laughs> yeah, what I'd, what I'd like to tell you is that we're planning for all scenarios. Um, and and, and I, I'm sorry, maybe I should have mentioned that to start with, but we're, we're planning for any scenario. What I'm trying to do is build a model that would work in any scenario. So I, I mentioned earlier, um, and if I'm sorry if it, it was pretty complicated, but hopefully you followed that scheduling model that I was talking about at middle school and high school, that intensive block schedule. That intensive block schedule could work if we were in phase zero, phase zero with full remote learning, or it could work if we were in phase one in a hybrid model. So imagine if you would, if we were in phase zero at full-time remote learning and a student was just focusing on two classes for maybe 16 or 30 days, we believe that that might be much easier for full-time remote learning. So I guess what I'm saying is that the models we're building, we're hoping will work in any of the phases and so we're really we're really building these contingencies so that if we are starting in phase one with this sort of hybrid school model we could easily move into phase two if things improved or if we felt like um, from the health department that that the, that that was safe to do so i i would tell you that um we're not just planning for one um example and we're not just planning for phase two what we're trying to plan for is a model of school that would work in any phase I guess a follow-up question to that is, um, are children then going to be in classes under phase two based on their alphabet name? So that the, if we were to move into phase one, having started in phase two, the children would still be, you know, so it's just, if we're not using the same process to sort children in the different phases, then we've, we're, we're doing something different. I know how, this is super complex stuff, but I just, um, wonder about starting from the most um, intensively different scenario and building upward from there instead of kind of building backward. Yeah, so I think, um, and, and it's getting late, and my brain's not <laughs> as sharp as it was this morning, but I think, um, Trustee Decker, that it, it would work if we, if we were in phase two and we did that, you know, that intensive block scheduling. So let's just say we had a class of 30 kids that had math for first period. We're gonna make an assumption that we could split that class. So if we were in phase one, half of those kids would come on Monday and Tuesday and the other half of the kids would come on Thursday and Friday. So they'd still be in the same 
class together, they'd still be learning the same material. The teacher would obviously have to reteach the material on Thursday and Friday that they had on Monday or Tuesday. And that alpha split may not be exactly perfect, but those are the, some of the things we need to work out. But that's the idea is that um, the, the schedule is the schedule. So the seven classes or the six classes that I signed up for, those classes are gonna, are gonna last for the whole quarter or the whole semester. But I, might, I may only be in class two days a week versus five days a week. Any other questions from trustees? Not seen any. I, I have just a couple, um, Dr. Watson. So is there um, identified costs involved in terms of each of the programs? I was looking at the presentation by the whole Tang crew and you know, the cafeteria style delivery of meals is probably going to have to change. And so I just, I want, I wonder where, you know, and the seating arrangements are going to have to be modified. And so, and I'm assuming custodial staff might have to be increased. So at some point, will the board hear about, you know, those kind of factors to make sure that we can keep all the students in school safe and the teachers, of course, too. Yeah, we've, um, we're already incurring some costs like, um, you know, cleaning, extra cleaning supplies. Uh, Pat and Terry, our transportation supervisor, have been talking with Beach about what the model might look like and any increased transportation costs. Um, there will be increased staffing costs. We, we know that. Um, so we're trying to, we're trying to budget for that. Um, we did receive some CARES Act money, but it's not you know, it's not unlimited, but we've tried to break that apart into technology and staffing and transportation and uh, trying to keep things in those buckets so we have enough money to cover anything we might need. I mentioned the computer purchase. We use some CARES Act money as well as some um, general fund money um, to, and some tech fund money to really cobble together that purchase for more devices so that we could go to remote learning right away if we needed to. Um, and so all of those costs are, are part of the budget, but we can give you a more complete picture as we get closer to the start of the year. Okay, I just, I mean, my question was simply, or more generally, that's a factor to be considered is just, you know, what this might, how this might impact our budget. Not specific details, but. Thanks, I'm just looking to see anyone else. Whoops, this went out of chat. Sorry, I'm having problems getting back to chat. I'm not seeing any more board questions in chat at this point. Thanks. There are a couple of public comment questions with raised hands, but I realize you haven't called for public comment yet. Okay, and so I'm just gonna to try to get out of I messed up my chat room. Um, so if you can help me, it looks like Trustee Decker has another question or is that the question from a little bit ago? I'm not sure. Trustee Decker, do you have a, yes, another question it looks okay. like. It's Trustee Decker. Hi, thanks. I don't, I know that we, we don't want to keep asking and asking lots of questions, but, but I do have lots of questions, as I'm sure lots of people in the public do. Um, I'm curious about so many components of the plan. Um, I'm curious about what um, circumstances, under what circumstances a family would be able to request um, fully remote learning. Um, whether that's a simply a matter of making that request or whether there are certain circumstances that'll be allowable and not. Um, I'm curious about the logistics of buildings and how many bathrooms and sinks are available and how hand washing, which takes time for large, for large groups, how that's going to be built in and, and planned for. Um, I have questions about um, teachers and um, teachers, at what point teachers will be 
making requests or, or opting to return to buildings, but how that works for them and what that does for their um, work situation. I, I have many and I don't want to be too pushy or take too, too much time myself, but I'm sure lots of people have, have questions as well. Any other trustee questions? This is information only. Not seen any. So I see several people with ironically blue hands up. And so sure I don't know what, in what order the hands went up, but Julie Merritt has a hand up. And after Julie, Elizabeth Williams has a hand up. And I will continue to look for more hands. So um, Ms. Merritt. Chair Holland, can I, can I just address a couple of Trustee Decker's questions. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I and I, I I'll try to be brief as 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 always. And one of the things we'll uh, we've been uh, creating is a frequently asked questions document. Um, so some of the questions Trustee Decker's asking, we'll we'll try to make sure a reference on that. But what I would say is, uh, with regards to remote learning under under phase one and phase two, we're recommending that any family or student that requests remote learning, will, it will be granted. There's no restrictions on that. Um, if, we, if we are in phase three with more of a traditional model, then, then we would probably resort to what we've done in the past when, when students request homebound instruction, which is an individualized plan request. Um, and then just a couple of other things. Um, I appreciate the comment on hand washing. Um, it's some, something we really struggled with last March is figuring out how to build that in the schedule. So we're, we're going to have to be cognizant of that. And I don't have an answer for that right now. Um, and then uh, the, as far as the teachers uh, and other staff beyond teachers, any, any staff member that, um, that can't come back to work, we're, we're building a process for what that looks like and how they request uh, a telework option. Um, so that, that's in progress as well. And before I um, return to public comment, I just wanted to make one additional observation that it looks like we might finally get a later start time for high schools <laughs> the current plan, which is an irony of being in this situation. So um, Ms. Merritt, if you wanna go ahead, and then I see it's Ms. Williams and I think it's um, Mr. Shearer. So Ms. Merritt. Chairperson Holland, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was thinking the same thing, that it took a pandemic to get our later start time for the high school kids. So, um, but that in jest, I want to say I appreciate all of the hard work uh, Dr. Watson at UN and all the staff have been putting in. I'm, I'm sure that it's just maddening. Uh, one of the items that I wanted to ask about that um, hasn't been mentioned um, tonight is uh, testing. What, uh, you know, are we going to have regular testing for teachers and students to try and uh, keep a pulse on um, how much transmission is happening? Um, have there been any discussions around that? And just to remind everyone, um, Public comment means that um, Dr. Watson won't answer, answer public comment questions now, but you certainly feel, feel free to call him or me at any time. But this is the time that we'd love to know about the things you're thinking about. So thank you for your public comments. And, and so I will spell Julie's last name. It's M-E-R-R-I-T-T -T for our minutes. And then Ms. Williams. Hi, um, thanks so much for all the hard work that you have all done. Um, I wanna echo what Julie Merritt said on that note. Um, I also have a question recognizing that it won't be answered right now, but something to consider. Um, Superintendent Watson talked about um, how important and how, how much they're stressing trying to not mix groups, but then, um, busing came up in the conversation at one point. And so I'm curious um, what that will look like and if that's been considered, um, if, if cohorts will be bused together regardless of where they live and the bus routes will just look different and be less efficient or um, if that's been considered at all. Thank you. Thanks. And Mr. Shearer? 
Good evening. Thank you all for your time and thank you for those that have been working on these plans. I just have a couple of concerns. Um, one is from the perspective of families in Missoula. And I know that we're trying to do the right thing by planning for all of these scenarios, but you're putting, we are putting families in an impossible situation because now I have to find childcare for three days a week or five days a week or two days a week. And I've got six weeks to do it, but I don't have six weeks because I'm not going to know the plan for another two weeks, but it took me a year to get childcare for three days a week, a year ago. Right? So like there's a childcare shortage and you're giving families four weeks to solve that problem. That's an impossible problem. And so I know it seems awful to say this is what we're going to do for fall regardless of what the circumstances are but I, I the sooner we do that the better families can plan and make arrangements because it's so unfair to working class and our most vulnerable populations to say four weeks out or a week out you got to find child care for three days a week you're on your own that's just not fair and I don't think we're really considering that um the second piece is, I think we should really be thinking about, or I'm sure you have, but high school can look different than K through five. High school could be all remote, right? And, and K through five could be in person. And there doesn't seem to be enough discussion about, about splitting these two. Um, and I know the science is changing rapidly, et cetera, but it seems like the transmission among uh, high schoolers is much higher than it is among um, little kids. And then the third piece, I just want to say, and I guess it's kind of fairness, but at the same time, the reason why remote learning in the spring wasn't very successful is because we had two week, five days, seven days as teachers to convert to remote learning. And it feels like now, instead of having four weeks to plan for remote learning and build out my class for remote learning, I'm, I'm I'm going to be in a position again where I've got two weeks to do that, but I don't have to plan for remote learning right now. I have to plan for remote learning. I have to plan for either six weeks at a time or four weeks, 29 days or 16, because that hasn't been decided. And then I have to plan for remote learning and in-person instruction. So as a teacher, we've got three plans, but I've got six weeks to implement a course of study for each one of those three plans. That's a disservice to our students. And if what we're really concerned about is learning loss, we need to put teachers in a position where we can plan as best we can for, I don't know, maybe two scenarios instead of three. <laughs> but I get the transition to remote learning might happen like that, right? And so we can anticipate that. But the transition to remote learning or hybrid model, we, we just have to consider that we could do remote learning so much better if we had even four weeks lead time, yet alone six. So if I was in, in my position, I really wish we could, we could make this decision and we can live with it for the fall and reevaluate come November 1st for January 17th. So thank you guys, uh, uh, the Board of Trustees, for taking the time to consider all of this. It's uh, a lot of really difficult decisions to make. So. I appreciate that and thank you for the time for the public comment. And thanks for the public comment and just for the minutes, um, it's E-Z-R-A-S-H-E-A-R-E-R -E -E in terms of Ezra's public comment. And um, Hatton, in case people don't remember, do you want to remind them how to raise their hand? So if they want to make public comment and then I see that Anna with no last name wants to make public comments her hand is up sure thing so for our guests that have joined online uh if you go to the bottom of your screen and click on the icon that has two little bodies and says participants it will open a little window on the side of your screen at the bottom of that window you'll see a button for a raise hand so that's how you can be acknowledged if you are joining on your computer if you're on your phone you can press the keys star nine on your telephone keypad and that will raise your hand for a phone participant and then we'll call on you. Um, and when Anna um, unmutes herself to make her public comment, Anna, if you could identify yourself with your first and last name, that would be great. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Anna Beard, uh, B-E-A-R-D. Um, again, I wanted to thank everyone for their hard work and all of the consideration that they're putting into this. Um, I know that there's no easy answers in any of this. Um, I think one thing that I wanted to voice that is a concern um, is like kids with IEPs. Uh, I've got two kiddos that have differing needs and one who has um, a physical disability who when we transferred to remote learning, it was really helpful the way that our team like transitioned and checked in. Like there wasn't a whole lot that they could do, but there was constant check-in um, and we felt supported. But then on the other side of the coin, I have my son who has um, behavioral and emotional needs and those things don't come out very often at school. And so in our access for support and in trying to do data collection and everything, um, you know, it was harder to access those things because these were behaviors that they didn't see at school, but, but we saw at home and were so disruptive at home on a good day. Um, and I think about going into remote learning again, and I think about how the first thing that came up to us was how much we were hurting without those supports and also how impossible it was to get those supports now that we were at home. Um, there is a long, long wait list for occupational therapists in Missoula, um, not to mention that that's still more time spent out of the house and being exposed. Um, and so I think that one really big thing that needs looked at is how do you support the kids who were you know, who have social emotional needs or who have supports that they need, um, who weren't getting those services at school based on the fact that they were at school and, and the behavior was different at school. Um, we had a, a teacher at one point comment on how different it was to see my son on a Zoom call and she was like, this is so different. Like this is what every day is though and I can't get him to sit down and do a homework assignment if, you know, it's, this difficult to keep him regulated in his safe space um, and in a place that has always been where he can be dysregulated or where he can be hyperactive or he can, you know, fall apart. Um, and I just think, I think there's gonna be a lot of kids who are sitting on like fine lines with IEPs and special education services who I'm really worried are gonna fall through the cracks. And I think that unfortunately, that is going to target a lot of kids with mental health stuff, with, with that social emotional aspect. And I, I don't know what the answer is to that either, but I hope that those kids are really considered in this as well. That is all. Thanks. Uh, Chair Holland, would you like me to read the comment which has been entered into chat or would you like to read it? I was just going to check with Brittany and just see if she wanted to make it or have it read. And uh, so she didn't ask for it to be read. Oh, okay. It, yes, if you want to do it, that would be great. I think you can be heard a little bit better than me. Thank you. No, no problem. And Brittany, I'll ask you to chat me your full name so we can get that in the minutes. Brittany says, I'm a parent of an upcoming first grader considering remote learning. I have two questions. First, if we choose remote learning initially, but circumstances change, i.e. a vaccine is available, virus circulation decreases, would we be able to return our student to in-person learning at any point? My other question for those that choose remote learning is, would there be a way to incorporate some form of lower risk socialization? Perhaps small groups of students could meet outdoors in socially distanced settings for a chance to see peers and check in with school staff. I'm thinking outdoor PE or art classes once or twice a week. I feel this may reduce the social emotional stress associated with remote learning for those students that have underlying conditions. And that comment was from Brittany McPherson, M-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. And then we've got two individuals with raised hands uh, the first is the phone number ending in 2775. You just need to press star six to unmute yourself and then you can make your comment. Hi, my name is Melissa Cotter, C-O-T-T-E-R. And I am just want to say that I'm really appreciative of the first comment about <clears throat> the need to be able to plan childcare. 
ahead of time and have time to find childcare. And then the second is just to uh, reiterate my sentiment that I put in that poll, which is I'm an essential worker. I had a three and a half year old and a seven year old, a first grader at Lowell during uh, the school shutdown. And it was horribly stressful because I was working full time as a nurse as well. And I don't know how to do that. I wonder if there's any additional supports being planned for families with essential workers who um, just are not available to be their, their child's teachers um, and caregivers during the day as well. And that's it. Thank you for your comments. And I see that Casey Ballou has her hand up. Uh, Ms. Ballou, do you have public comment? Yes, I do. Casey Ballou, um, middle school teacher and Missoula Education Association president. Um, just like you heard Mr. Scherer say, we are definitely grappling with this issue as educators. You know, we, uh, we want to go back. It's what we love to do being in person and teaching. It's what we're trained in. It's what we're the best at. But we've been making adjustments. And you saw that as we switched in the spring on the fly and did some crisis teaching. We called it remote education, but really it was crisis teaching. And uh, I think that's one thing that you need to know is that those online elements that we have coming up in the fall, you know, we've had time to adjust, adapt, and overcome and listen to all the feedback. So it'll definitely look different and better. I mean, teachers are problem solvers and that's definitely what we thrive in. Um, so our job is to, you know, kind of look at this as that two layer issue. Do we have, um, you know, with Superintendent Watson's plan that he's laid out, a phased plan that we can, you know, feel safe at those different levels. And then the second part of that is what level are we really safe in now? You know, as we look at making that safe and predictable environment for kids and staff, where do we actually fit? So thanks for your patience as we do that. Thanks for your support. We're excited. Thank you. Any other public comment? And if you raise your hand, if you're participating not on the phone, I'm just going down the list to see if there's any more raised hands. We do have an additional raised hand from Anna again. Okay. Um, Anna? Um, I just wanted to add additionally the concern that I would have for low-income families that don't have the luxury to choose between free accessible childcare and paying rent. Um, I think that there's going to be some families that do get to truly consider that, but there's going to be a lot of parents who, who can't. So thank you again for your comments. And as I indicated, that's one of the reasons we added this as an information item so we can get feedback from the trustees and the public so that Dr. Watson and the board can hear what concerns people have are. So thank you all for your public comment. Is there any more public comment? I'm just going to scroll down through the participants to see. Manhattan, please help me if I'm overlooking anyone. Uh, there just was one additional raised hand at the top from Julie Merritt. Okay, Ms. Merritt. Sorry to double. Yeah, comment? Julie Merritt here again. Um, it, it, a couple of other items that are on my mind for concerns are uh, with the high school kids, if they are um, in the building. Um, the, it sounds like the uh, um, medical professionals are going to be re recommending that people change their face masks every couple of hours. And so I'm wondering if we'll be able to make some accommodations for that. And then just generally about the ventilation in the classrooms, I know that that is also a, a, a big issue with transmission in indoor spaces that uh, when we have more better ventilation, it's, it's healthier for people. And hopefully some of the investments that we've made through the, um, all of the work that we've done on our schools have improved those ventilation systems, but I'm wondering if there's been thought with any additional um, 
measures that could be taken in that area. Thanks. Thank you again for your public comment. And I'm just checking to see if there's any additional public comment. And um, I believe, Dr. Watson, if you can remind me, is there a mechanism by which um, the administration can receive public comment in a way other than by attending a board meeting and providing public comment here without being participating in the survey or, or more formal mechanisms for getting feedback? If you could remind us of ways. Yes, we have, a, we have an email established, a public comment email, um, and we, we, can, we can put that in the chat. Thank you. Any additional public comment on this agenda item? Thank you all. We appreciate all your comments. They're all very thoughtful. And we'll go ahead and move on to topic two, which is the high school transfer policy and procedures. Again, this is information only. So Dr. Watson, as, as you noted in the background at the June 23rd board meeting, we talked about the first reading of the high school transfer policy 2140, and it's currently available for public comment. So um, could you provide us some additional information on this? Thanks. Yes, I, um, <clears throat> I intended to, uh, again, make sure that you had an opportunity to ask questions regarding the policy um, that, I, that I'm proposing. Um, we, we talked about the policy last time and there were several suggestions uh, regarding the policy and questions. I, I wanted to make sure that you had a chance also to see the procedure. Uh, please understand that procedures in draft form, uh, just like the policy, uh, a, a procedure is, is really um, written at any time we write a procedure, it's really written for the implementation of the policy. So you can think of a policy as sort of the overarching um, rule, whereas a procedure really defines how we're gonna implement that rule. And so that's, that's why procedures are generally longer than policies um, and procedures can change over time. Uh, policies can also change, but a policy change requires two readings with the Board of Trustees, um, but a procedural change can change more frequently. And the way it changes is that generally the way procedures change is a couple of ways. Uh, number one, you find something in the procedure that's contradictory to the policy or doesn't align well with the policy, so you change the procedure so it aligns with the policy. The other time you change a procedure is when you're implementing a policy and um, you find out that something doesn't work the way you thought it should when you first wrote the policy. So you might change how you implement the policy through the procedure. So procedures do change over time um, more frequently than policies, but a procedural change does not require um, the uh, approval of the Board of Trustees. A procedure is more of an administrative um, procedure, so it just, it just requires the approval of the administration. So, um, sorry, that was a long explanation of what a procedure is, but I thought it was important to tell you that. There's a lot in this procedure. I don't necessarily want to go through all of it because it was in the board packet, and I'm assuming that if you have specific questions on certain parts, you'll ask those questions. Um, but what I would tell you is that um, what we tried to uh, elaborate in this first bulleted list is really some... Um, restrictions or guidelines that's, that students will have to adhere to in order to use the transfer request. Um, and so, you know, there's things like we reserve the right to return a student if, the, um, if there's overcrowding. Uh, students who are granted a transfer um, are subject to eligibility policy, policies with the Montana High School Association if they participate in extracurricular activities. Um, the other one that I think was mentioned at the last one, but just to be clear that no transfers will be made to accommodate extracurricular activities. Um, a student might transfer for a different reason, but even if they do transfer for a different reason, they're still held to the Montana High School Association transfer policy. Um, I wanted to talk um, in more specifics about the, uh, about the reasons that we might accept a transfer. So um, we tried to, 
um, elaborate on these priorities. So remember at the last time we talked about, we would use this priority list um, for, tr for approving transfers. What we tried to do is define what a student will have to do under each one of those priorities. So um, legal and safety is generally, um, it's, it's generally dictated by external forces. So it could be a restraining order, it could be a safety order through a court, um, it could be some sort of legal order through, through a court system. That generally is what dictates legal and safety issues. So that one typically would require documentation from, from that external um, agency. There's also other times that a student may choose to transfer because of a mental or a physical health issue. And what we'd ask, um, we asked for, you know, the transfer form, a letter from the student detailing the request, a letter from the parent, and then any supporting documentations. It could be a letter from a, a physician or a letter from a mental health professional. Um, then we get into academic requests. Um, something that's specific about academic requests is again, a um, letter from a student detailing the explanation for the request. Um, also, you'll notice on all of these, we talk about current grades and graduation check form. We put that in there because before we transfer a student, we wanna make sure that, they will still, that they're still on track to meet graduation requirements based on the new school. Um, siblings, we defined a sibling to be any sibling of a student that's currently enrolled at the school. So, you know, if your sibling graduated a year ago, you're no longer considered as considered a sibling at that school. Um, so your sibling has to be currently enrolled at the same time that you're requesting the transfer. Um, children as staff, we defined that a little bit more just so folks understand what that means. And then that we always have this other request. Um, so any reason that doesn't fall within the previous priorities would be the lowest, pri lowest priority granted um, with the reminder that we don't, we're not gonna grant requests based on extracurricular activities. So I'm gonna stop there. I know there's a lot in that procedure and I thought it would be helpful for you to see um, what we're proposing to actually implement the policy, um, just so you have that background. Okay. Oh, thanks. So I'm looking to see if there's, it looks like Trustee Lorenzen has a question and then I'll, and then Trustee Mercer has a question. So Trustee Lorenzen, then Trustee Mercer. So Dr. Watson, I just, we, we keep saying transfer, but this also applies to students from eighth grade going into ninth grade who are trying to choose a school outside their tenants area as well, correct? Yes, and in some other um, areas, it's called an out of area request. So we could we could refer to that in that way. So if I'm an eighth grader and I'm requesting a school outside my neighborhood, then that would be an out of area request. But yes, the same rules apply. Could I ask a follow up question then? Yeah. So would we change the terminology to clarify that if you're not yet in a high school? So it would be a transfer or out of district request, or are you suggesting we have a whole separate policy for ninth graders going into? Uh, no, I, I'm not actually, we're, we would use the same process and procedure. And so um, one thing you'll know, I didn't talk about the deadlines, but we have language in here for eighth graders. So December 15th for all current eighth graders, okay. um, would be the deadline. And then we also, um, we, we reference eighth graders somewhere else in here. I can't remember where. <laughs> Yeah. So high school transfer is read broadly enough to mean if you're supposed to be going to one school and you want to be going to a different school, no matter what incoming grade you'd be going into, it's a transfer. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yep. And we would be using the same process and procedure for, for those eighth graders going into ninth grade. Okay. Thanks. And then Trustee Mercer has a question. Then I think Trustee Decker has a question. So... I guess confirming when I did the math, it sounded like the way it is right now, at least last year, Hellgate was up like a net 110 and the other two were pretty close to a wash. Um, which leads to my question. I guess I'm just wondering, I understand prioritizing 
certain things, but subject to space availability, why not say anyone transfers? Do whatever, I mean, subject to this timing requirements, all that, but if you meet our timing requirements and there's space available, you can go. And a sort of a sub point of that is, why not extracurricular activity? Why make someone lie about wanting to take some class rather than just, if there's space available, let them go. What's the downside of that? Uh, gr great question, uh, Trustee Mercer. I, I think the downside that we've seen is it's being applied inconsistently. Um, and uh, as I, I think I mentioned in the last meeting, um, there, there isn't any real clear rationale for why kids transfer. And I think what you're asking is like, well, what if we just allow anyone to transfer for any reason? And we've pretty much done that. But the problem is, is that um, kids are being told no right now, um, but there's really no rationale for why they're being told. And so um, without having some guidelines in place, um, what I fear and what I believe is happening is it's, it's being applied inconsistently and it's not equitable for all students. And it looks like Trustee Decker had a question. Yeah, my question is related to um, specifically the Health Science Academy, but also other programs like perhaps the, Vo the Ag Center or um, programs that are really are unique to certain um, schools. And how, especially if this policy applies to eighth graders entering, um, how we go about, um, and I'm not just asking this because I have a rising eighth grader myself right now, um, how do we go about letting students know about what schools look like so they can make an informed decision about whether they're requesting a transfer? And then my sort of secondary question around that is, is there um, an advantage in some of those programs at starting off in the school in which they're housed? Um, and do students often opt in um, at later times, that kind of thing? Yeah, those are great questions. So just to clear up um, the language around this. So the Health Science Academy is a good example that that is, uh, that is specific to Big Sky. Um, and so if a student were interested in that program, they should apply in the eighth grade. And the way that we would do that is as long as they got it in before December 15th, that would give us enough time to staff appropriately for that. So if it's an academic reason based on a program like that, that's only at one school, then yes, I think it's, um, it's, 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 it's more easily accomplished through this process. Uh, a program like agriculture education is available to any student, no matter which school they're at. There's a transfer bus that happens a few times a day. And so um, I could be a student that remains at Hellgate High School and remain a Hellgate High School student, but still participate in agriculture education um, while remaining at, at Hellgate High School. So, um, but the, the better question that you really asked that I wanna answer, make sure I answer is, we, we need to do a better job in explaining what some of the options are for kids. Um, I think, again, I think um, kids, um, find out through a bunch of different ways, but we can always do a better job. And we've, we've tried and we've done better, but I think we can always do a better job in explaining what some of the options are. I still hear from some of our rural superintendents that kids don't really know what the options are. And so um, we'll need to work on that. And Trustee Mercer has a follow-up question. So uh, I guess a follow-up to that and, and to your answer to my prior question. So would you oppose an amendment to it that said something to the effect of space available, everyone should know that a timely application will be granted. I mean, just making super explicit that if you ask, this is the thing that you can get. It's not something magic that you should be scared of asking for. Yeah, I'm just reviewing the policy and um, what I'm asking, what I'm asking myself is that statement in the policy or the procedure? But to me, sorry, the follow -up, being the policy, because to be able to understand the policy is what do we want, right? And it seems to me the board should take a position. Do we want to allow routine high school transfers or not? And it should be clear that they're allowed or clear that they're not allowed. You need special circumstances to get in there. That's what's troubled me about all this. So, sorry. 
I, I, like, that, that's my question is I guess to me, why not put it in the policy? You know, Trustee Lorenzen has a statement she'd like to make. And just to clarify for Trustee Lorenzen, this is information only. At a certain point, there will be board debate on adopting the policy. But I believe that um, the reason for bringing forward information only at this time, because it's still out for public comment. And also at the last board meeting, we had suggested that it would be helpful for the trustees to see the procedures being developed in order to make a informed decision about you know what the language of the policy itself should look at so like trustee lorenzen go ahead it's just that what is now being in the form of questions is actually uh arguments that we are not allowed to participate in so at this point we're just looking at it if if we have to wait to debate it i think the entire board needs to wait to debate it and not debate it in the terms of a superintendent question Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Watson? I'm not seeing any other requests for trustee questions. Um, as I indicated, this is information only at this time. It will be brought forward as an action item later, but is there any public comment at this time, because we would also be taking public comment at the point that it's up for consideration for adoption by the board. I'm just looking for hands raised. Apologies. I'm not, oh, um, Angela Miller has a hand raised. Ms. Miller, if you have public comment. And again, public comment is a comment that will not be answered tonight, but if you have a concern or a comment, it will be considered by the administration and the board. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So, I can. so I have two comments um, as a lay person. So I have two students at Hellgate High School who would otherwise be going to Big Sky. So I'm reading this as a lay person and my first comment was it's not immediately clear if this applies to students who are already in a receiving school. And if so, if that means they're essentially going on a year to year semester to semester basis. So I think some clarification would be helpful around that. And then my second observation was overcrowding is undefined. So overcrowding could mean either a student to teacher ratio or in the middle of a pandemic, it could mean something quite different. So those are things that could be very devastating to kids who have already created their social circle within their high school that they've already been in for a couple of years only to find out that they may get bumped either due to overcrowding um, or just simply due to um, any, of the, any of the policy um, terminology that may cause them to get returned back to their districts or their, their boundary school. Thank you for your public comment. As I indicated before, we really appreciate public comment. Um, so as to form um, a better discussion when it comes before us as an action item. And I see that um, Mr. Shearer has his hand raised. Mr. Shearer? Yeah, just a question to answer. Um, how do we make sure they're transferring for an academic reason? So eighth grader, let's say they're an exceptional student and an exceptional student athlete wants to uh, go for the AP capstone program at Sentinel High School. So they enroll, they indicate that in ninth grade. Are they going to have to take an AP class in ninth grade? Or what if they, so what's going to happen? Because technically you don't have to start that program until your junior year. So then by their junior year, they still haven't taken an AP. Like what's the hey, you said you're gonna do this for academic. That means your first semester, you're in an AP class, or if you're a Sentinel kid, you're in an IB class over at, at Hellgate or Health Science. So 
what's that look like? If it's an academic reason, how do we make sure they follow through on whatever that reason is? Anyway, thank you for doing this work. I know a lot of people are really passionate about it and you've probably heard tons of different opinions about it. So good work, thank you. So thank you for your comments. We appreciate, we really truly appreciate hearing from the public about things that the board will be acting on. I'm just checking to see if I see that anyone else from the public wants to comment on this information item. And again, I'll reiter reiterate and emphasize that we'll come before the board on a later agenda as an action item. So we would you know, appreciate public comment at that time as well. I, and I don't think I see any more hands raised. No, nope, I'm not seeing any on my side either. Okay, so we will move on to item number nine, which is to approve the superintendent's contract and terms. And so if you look beginning on page 50, I will explain that, you know, Rob had submitted proposed change, or Dr. Watson had submitted proposed changes, primarily changing dates, and um, also taking out some language about a, a firm date by which this evaluation needs to be done because there is a state statute that if he falls within a certain category, it has to be done by a certain date, but otherwise there really is no reason to adhere to a specific date. And then finally, the increase in salary is tied to the increase in salary that staff received. I've communicated, I've talked with our legal counsel, Elizabeth Calava. She um, sees nothing inappropriate about the recommended um, requests that Dr. Watson has made. And so, you know, the recommendation, unless someone has questions for me, then the recommendation is that we take action on the superintendent's contract and its terms. So any, I, Ms. Calava and Ms. Um, and Megan Morris both indicated they would be willing to be at or be able to be at this board meeting, but the terms are very straightforward and not completely complicated. So I indicated that they didn't need to be there, but if anyone has questions since I've talked it over with them, I'd be happy to try to answer them. So I'm just looking in chat to see. I don't see anyone with questions. So the, there, there isn't a recommendation, but the question is, um, if you approve the contract and its terms as it appears in our agenda, then the motion would be to approve the contract and its terms as found in our agenda. And so I'm just looking to see if anyone wants to make a motion and how and what they want to state. And so Trustee Sturbus has indicated she has moved to approve the contract and its terms. Um, Trustee Old Person has seconded um, the motion. So now is the time for board um, comment. And so either unmute yourselves or raise your hands if you have a comment or just let me know in chat. I'm just trying to check to see if any hands are raised. I'm not seeing any hands raised. In that case, I will make a comment. I don't think when we went through the hiring process to hire Dr. Watson to become the superintendent of schools in Missoula, we imagined that he would also be leading us through how to respond to a pandemic. And I can't think of a person that I would um, put my confidence in, in thinking about everything that he's been thinking about, the hours that he's been putting in to do this. And anyway, I wholeheartedly support approving Dr. Watson's contract and the small incremental pay increase. I think we all wish, you know, our budget would allow something to recognize how you have been such a good leader and actually been a leader to your staff and to your, to the students 
and to the teachers and to the parents and to communicate with everyone, you know, from the beginning when you took the job, you effectively communicated and then life turned upside down and it even required a significant level of attention to detail and thinking ahead of the time. And so I just want to say on behalf of myself, I really appreciate that you're willing to stick around in Missoula. So anyone else have a comment in light of my comments, other than there's some comments being made in chat indicating they agree. So um, with that, is there any public comment? I'm just gonna check and see if there's any. I don't see any virtual hands raised and I don't see any requests in chat to make public comment. And so all of the trustees in favor of, let me get the language, of approving the contract and the terms which is found in our agenda, please indicate your um, approval by typing in yes into chat. Vogel is yes. Thank you. And somehow I have just done something, so I need to actually vote myself. I'm going to verbally vote because I've messed up chat. So Trustee Holland votes yes. And then let me double check when I go back up so I can see. And it, it, the motion has passed unanimous, unanimously as to all trustees present. So the motion passes. And so we will appreciate your leadership for another year beyond the year that you've already signed up for. So thank you for leading us through this pandemic. And so with that, we have indicated at the beginning of the meeting that um, the administration is working with the employee to come up with an alternate solution. So there is no um, request for employee termination. So with that, we move on to public comment on any non-agenda item for anyone who's remained on the phone or in person or virtually here for anything that you'd like to bring to our attention that we haven't discussed tonight. I will check one more time for public comment on non-agenda items. I'm not seeing any. So with that, we are adjourned. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all and good night. Thank, thank you. you.